Namaste and greetings. I, Dr. Saurabhi Kimire, Research and Communication Associate at IMPI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Eva Miti Anisandan Santan, Naidu, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPI Web Policy Learning. We are gathered here today for day two of a three day online certificate training program on understanding recurring heat waves risk, impact, and the way forward for resilience. This training course is organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, India, and IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development, or CECCST, Impact and Policy Research Institute. The patron for the program is Shri Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM New Delhi. Our convener and moderator is Shri Dikender Singh Panwar, former Deputy Mayor, Shimla, Senior Fellow, IMPRI. Our conveners are Professor Alin K. Gupta, Head of ECDRM, NIDM New Delhi, Dr. Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI, and Dr. Somedip Chattopadhyay, Associate Professor, Vishwa Bharati Shanti Niketan, Visiting Senior Fellow, IMPRI, New Delhi. This course will be conducted by various expert resource persons comprising eminent academicians, journalists, senior researchers, and policy practitioners. The distinguished resource persons have great experience gained in the field along with the expertise. Our experts for today's course are Dr. Gulrez Shah Azhar, Professor Joy Sri Roy, and Sri Anup Kumar Srivastava. The organizing team consists of Fatima Amin and Dr. Upal Verma, NITM. Dr. Saurabhi Kimire, Utkarsh Divedi, and Diyako Swami Impu. We are very grateful to the NIGM team, and particularly Professor Anil K. Gupta and his team, and Chikendar Panwarji for spearheading this timely training course on the important issue of heat waves and its impact. I welcome all of you for this enlightening deliberation and Thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts in understanding emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in disaster management and helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants through this course, which we believe will lead to a very fruitful outcome. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be Q&A session after each presentation. Share questions on the Q&A box only. The questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee. Ensure that the questions are precise and please refrain from making any general comments in the questions to save time. Now let us start our first session. The first distinguished expert for the second day of this training program is Dr. Gulrez Shah Azhar. Dr. Azhar is an independent researcher and former researcher, University of Washington and Brand Corporation, USA. Dr. Azhar is joining us from Seattle and we would like to thank him for taking the time to be part of this program. We welcome you, sir, and please take over the session. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorby, for the kind introduction. And uh, before uh, University of Washington and Rand, I was in India. I was an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Public Health, uh, Gandhinagar, Gujarat, for four years. So I did a lot of uh, my starting uh, work on heat, health impacts of heat, actually started in India. So there I was working on at the city level, and I think some people are aware of it. And after that, I moved to the US from 2014. And so I worked as a stem policy researcher at the Rand Corporation. So there uh, I 
uh, and I'll be presenting that work and uh, I'll talk about that work later. And after that, yes, I moved sir. to the University of Washington and there was a senior fellow in the forecasting team at the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. So <laughs> I was forecasting things. Okay. Thank, anyway. you so much, Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. much. Uh, so here's my, uh, there are some slides. So this is the work I did uh, at RAND. This was a part of my uh, dissertation work also, and it was also published uh, separately as, uh, as uh, in, 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 in journals. So very quickly, and again, this is preaching to the choir because obviously we all in India are aware of the uh, impacts of heat waves, but uh, sometimes I had to uh, bring this slide to bring it context to you know the international audience. So uh, why do we study heat waves? And now since we're surrounded by heat waves, it's pretty obvious. But uh, I mean, a decade ago when I started doing this, it, you actually had to make a case of why you're doing work on heat waves because it affects among the most vulnerable people here in the U.S. It affects people who are homeless. Uh, who are you know marginalized who live in communities of color uh, places which are which don't typically have civic resources so it disproportionately affects you know the most vulnerable people of the society uh, in fact uh, researchers often call heat as one of the most uh, defining inequality issues of our times so another reason is it's uh, heat wave deaths uh, are often underreported and understudied. So, and, and that's, uh, there's no deliberate re reason behind this. The reason is often the way heat deaths are uh, coded, uh, recorded, uh, that leads to issues with, uh, you know, uh, deaths. Because heat deaths are often, um, uh, are not the direct cause of death. It doesn't show up on the death certificate. Uh, a very small uh, proportion of all deaths during a heat wave event would be classified or coded as deaths due to heat stroke or sunstroke. I mean, heat what does in majority of cases, it becomes an underlying cause, which stresses your physiological reserves. So what it leads to is it would, I mean, people, someone already has a pre-existing cardiovascular condition, for example. So heat would make it bad. It would exacerbate it. So the death could be the immediate cause of death would be a cardiorespiratory arrest, but it wouldn't have happened otherwise if it wasn't so hot. So heat, you know, it's, kind of, it, it makes things bad, right? So that's why uh, underreporting of uh, happens in heat conditions. And uh, 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 some could argue that it's understudied given the, you know, the enormity of the problem. The vulnerability to heat is also multifaceted. So there are not just, you know, physiological, you know, biological issues. It, it, there are also social issues around heat, environmental issues, the issues of justice, uh, which around, uh, which come across, uh, you know, when we study the subject of heat. Uh, there are huge economic costs. Uh, and economic costs, in this study, we'll talk about only direct economic costs in terms of death, but heat also impacts, you know, leads to morbidity. It's not just mortality, right? So morbidity would uh, translate into, I mean, if it's just really hot, we know how it feels when it's really hot, right? We are not efficient, we are not productive, and you know, we, we, we might feel angry. So that, the, those are also additional costs, and researchers are still working on ways to identify, you know, those measures, how do you, you know, make sense of those uh, mortality costs and morbidity costs. We'll talk about them soon. Again, I'm just so historical. So pre-COVID, these used to be huge numbers. When people talk about the you know infamous European heat wave, seventy thousand people dead in two thousand and three. Russian heat wave. This was also with forest fires. The numbers are debatable. Fifty six thousand. Some say around ten twelve thousand. Uh, yeah, somewhere there have been occasional regular heat waves in U.S. happens in California. Uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, all these places. In fact, when I started, and it's not really just heat waves, even forest fires. So when I started, uh, when I moved to the US, I was living in Santa Monica, and uh, in 2013, I'm um, sorry, in 15, it started. But over years, every year, the the amount of forest fires that was exponentially increasing. You'd have thousands of acres of, you know, forest fires every year increasing. And in, even in, in India, obviously, I mean, it's an annual occurrence now. Uh, uh, in future, what could happen? Uh, uh, the temperatures in Southwest Asia, they are projected to exceed the threshold of human adaptation. I mean, there's no other way to, uh, I mean, there's no other polite way to put this, but uh, if it exceeds a threshold for human adaptability, then, you know, then what, what do you do? 
heavily populated cities and there are a bunch of studies uh, they for example delhi it could have temperatures you know up to for for the majority of the year where minimum temperatures are more than 35 degrees centigrade and they are likely to increase because of this heat likely to increase in frequency in frequency intensity duration and depths so yeah uh, why should we focus on india of course i mean that's again i mean we are i mean i would just quickly go through these slides because I mean, something unique is, and we might have come across, uh, you know, your your uh, attention that um, places on the same latitude in India are actually hotter than places, you know, uh, on the same latitude, for example, you know, in, in other places, in the neighboring places. So, if you extend that line of latitude uh, from, uh, you know, in North India and extend it towards across the Himalayas and see in places in, for example, China, those places are much colder than uh, than the same places in India at the same latitude. India is going to be, some would say, arguably that it's even now it's among the, is the largest country on earth. So if you, you know, make sure that he doesn't impact people here, you're basically having a huge global impact, right? India also has a unique situation. India has a has also a large vulnerable population in terms of economic inequality. If you, I mean, you, if you talk about in absolute numbers, again, it's a big country, right? So absolute numbers also, India has a large uh, perhaps the largest number of absolute, you know, people, you know, in absolute poverty. It also uh, proportionately, it's also hugely an unequal society. So, uh, I, I, and overall, in terms of, you know, when we look at the literature, less is known from places which have the most impact. So, places which are affected most from heat, uh, for example, places like India or Africa or what we call collectively the global south, uh, we know relatively less even though those places are the ones which are facing the brunt of those health conditions, adverse health you know, conditions. So it's a study in extreme. We have seen this in summer. It's it's unique to people here in the West, but in India, we have seen this. Uh, why do we say India is a vulnerable state? So, okay, so this, uh, uh, okay. So, I mean, we have a large population. We have multidimensional vulnerability. I talked about this. Uh, health expenditure, the kind of money we should be spending on our healthcare is still, compared to international standards and global WHO recommendations is quite low. Uh, under nutrition, malnutrition, it's, it's quite common. It also, you know, impacts health. Uh, uh, poverty, I mean, there's some just numbers we know, and those numbers are probably have changed. Uh, water supply, sanitation, bathing facilities, and these all would have impact on a person's health, uh, you know, especially health. So we're looking at some, you know, uh, I'm sorry. So uh, it, this, this map shows uh, the wet bulb globe temperature projections for uh, different places. And we see that the WBGT temperature uh, these were the places which would, uh, you know, exceed uh, high thresholds of WBGT, and you see that those places uh, are usually been over the sea and uh, oceans. But land-based places, that is, you know, the north parts of North India and you know some parts of eastern parts of China. So those are the places which would see a lot of increase in temperature. So for this uh, this uh, research work, the, uh, I did in the form of three papers. I did, uh, I'm an epidemiologist by training. I'm also a medical doctor. So by training epidemiologists, they talk about time, place, and person. So this uh, study is also structured into those three uh, kind of uh, things. So in terms of time, we will talk about, you know, future projections of mortality from heat for India. Uh, for place, we were looking at heat places in India, which are more vulnerable to heat. And they're not those places which are hotter places. The places with, instead, these are those places where the combination of vulnerability makes it more at risk. And then person, we talk about personal adaptation strategies, what people could do to, you know, live through hotter temperatures. So let's start quickly with this uh, vulnerability assessment. So this paper uh, creates, the idea was behind this work was to create a map an integrated district level heat vulnerability index for India. And then of course, based on that, identify the most heat vulnerable districts in the country. So I'll quickly go over all of this. So, I mean, the kind of data we use for this index was I used was uh, using the census data for, for, for India, the district level household survey data. I used uh, maps from uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. They have a Bowen server, uh, maps for vegetation and greenery, and then used uh, NASA also has this MODIS server, which does land surface temperature. So I used uh, those maps for the summer month in June for, from, NASA, from NASA. I used district as a unit of analysis because 
for most of these variables, 140 variables, um, district was the the most granular level I had data on. I mean, I would have loved to do it at for, at a block level or perhaps you know urban clusters, but unfortunately, not all data was available at that level. Census data was, but not others. Uh, for the analysis, I, as I mentioned, I chose 140 variables in the initial data set based on the published literature. We screened for variables which would have, based on literature, impact on heat vulnerability. Uh, two ind independent reviewers blindly uh, uh, you know, selected those variables and they were included in the final analysis. So the analysis we did was uh, what we call factor analysis or principal component analysis, uh, in which these variables they cluster around each other based on uh, on these uh, domains vulnerability domains so and then we look for you know how strongly we rotate those you know clusters and then see which rotation those variables make sense so in vulnerable in terms of vulnerability domains uh, variables would cluster around demographic variables, some variables across about social class, socioeconomic conditions, about household amenities, land cover and population health. And it could be pretty obvious how these individual domains would be affecting uh, health status from each. So, for example, you know, having a land cover, having greenery around you would probably lead to, you know, less local, you know, temperatures, temperature increases. So that is good. Household amenities, so having a cell phone, a radio, a TV, internet, those kinds of things at home is also, you know, uh, not just, you know, you're available to receive health messaging, but also show some kind of, you know, economic, uh, you know, uh, angle to this. So then if you are if you're a better economic situation, you are less vulnerable to eat, those kind of things. So this is how these variables cluster around uh, in, uh, when we do this. So of course, I mean, the steps we're using state, I used QGIS because it was, uh, you know, uh, and merged census data. We com combined all these different sources of data together into one, clean, remove duplicates, missing data was substituted with state averages, calculated some estimates, correlation coefficients, uh, calculated Z scores, because again, the range for each of these variables would vary, right? So, you know, age would vary between, for example, zero to 100 versus, uh, you know, vegetation index would vary from zero to 255 based on the colors, pixel colors or something. So then, you know, bring all of them in one scale, bring all of them in one direction. So for example, you know, um, so, so that, you know, increasing value of that variable would mean increased vulnerability, right? So we would uh, put them all in the same scale, we will put them all in the same direction. Then we do the principal component analysis. We do the very try out different rotations. Varimax did seem to make sense. How do I know my analysis is okay? So there are different tests which we do on those. So there is a one called KMO test. There's a Kaiser criteria, Kaiser Mayer Olkin test. We do what they call a scree plot, and then we do this, you know, Elgin values. We do a cutoff line, all of that, and then we summate. So basically, get to these domains. So we decide, okay, these these four clusters are most are statistically significant, other clusters don't impact heat vulnerability. So then we have those individual cluster schools, we add them. And we add them because, you know, uh, I mean, that's the more simple, I mean, with models you say you do the simple thing, otherwise you can have another relationships. And then, you know, we do, we categorize them in terms of extreme values based on standard deviations. So if things are, for example, more than two standard deviation would be very high, less than uh, one to two standard deviation high, nor high normal, low normal, you know, low, very low. So that's how. So for example, uh, uh, this based on this calculating this heat index, uh, and this is not that map, right? So this map is for uh, uh, land surface temperature, right? So think of this map as an exposure map. So which place is this from NASA's MODIS data set overlaid a shape file of India by district. I think it's by block and then by districts perhaps. And then look at which places are, you know, hottest in mid June. Right, so you see this, and then this is the heat vulnerability index for the India for, for the country, and you kind of see that there is an overlap. There are, but there is not an absolute one-on-one -on -one overlap correlation. Again, because interesting, if you think about this, if people who are used to living in hotter areas may not necessarily be affected as much from higher temperatures because they use they're adapted to those higher temperatures, right? So that's why. When you do a heat vulnerability index for a large geographical area, you typically do not include heat as a temperature as an exposure variable in the index itself, right? So, 
again, anyway. So what we see with this index is based on that score that parts of, for example, centers, central parts of the country are more at risk. You, of course, some districts in the state of Rajasthan, Maharaj, Chhattisgarh, you know, Jharkhand, these are the, and these are individual districts based on their individual, you know, the variables, the values of individual variables, which are for these districts. So the availability of healthcare services, greenery, education, income, employment rates, all of those, whichever variables have gone into that index. So they would affect and together, you know, determine the vulnerability of the, uh, I mean, I apologize for the map because I mean, it's based on the shape files which are available internationally. So, so this is the map. So what is something to keep in mind with this is that uh, this is a relative ranking of heat wave vulnerability for all districts, right? So absolute terms, India is at a really high risk, but between all these districts, we can see which districts are at a higher risk versus which are at a lower risk. Uh, high and very high heat vulnerability districts are in the central parts of the country, as I said, the variables with greater correlation could be starting points for framing local adaptation strategies. So which some variables would have a very high correlation with, uh, for example, you know, a rural area or being living in an urban area, for example. So then you can think of interventions which are targeted in those for those variables. And, you know, uh, yeah, so this was the heat vulnerability index. Then I go, uh, the second paper, it talks about uh, the mortality estimation for India. This is a very, uh, sorry, it's not working. Oops, Oops sorry. Uh, for some reason, I just suddenly skipped uh, slides. Okay, so we did the heat index, then let's, yeah, so mortality estimates. So for this work, uh, I did, uh, the, uh, the idea was to estimate future heat wave deaths under different climate change scenarios. So we're talking about these representative concentration pathways, the four IC IPCC scenarios, so RCP 2.6, I'll come to them later. And then for the second effort, I was to estimate direct economic costs associated with these deaths. Remember, I mentioned something about direct costs, so you could value you know, statistical life. So it's easier to value mor mortality because it's an absolute, you know, either you're alive or you're dead. And so you can cost out uh, morbidity costing is difficult and we still need to, you know, do that. Anyway, so for this study, how, uh, how did I did go ahead? I looked at data, death data from India and there are several sources of data, uh, death data for the country. So we have the National Disaster Management Authority, obviously the annual, you know, report comes in. National Crime Records Bureau has data, had data from 2010, 2014, uh, not 10 to 14, I think it was nine, uh, for a 14 year period. Uh, that there is this European uh, disaster data set called MDAT, it's based in Belgium. They have some uh, reported deaths for uh, different disasters for different countries. Uh, uh, there are uh, published articles in scientific journals like uh, I think Infos Current Science uh, by you know researchers working in the Institute of Tropical Meteorology or Meteorological Department who often publish you know time series of annual deaths. Uh, Temperatures I could access through uh, the World Bank. They have this climate data portal. So they have you know, recorded past temperatures, the World Meteorological Organization, uh, multiple sources of data, right? Population and mortality. Interestingly, um, I used United Nations population projections. And interestingly, on a side note, I later on did work on UN, on, on not UN, on, on IHME's global population projections. So <laughs> it was interesting. Anyway, so we used uh, population data from uh, the United Nations. And obviously, the, the analysis was, some of it was descriptive analysis, calculated different kinds of indices. Uh, then second stage was then looking at, descriptive is basically just plot and see if data makes sense and stuff. Then looking at uh, exposure response functions. So I tried out different models. Uh, the most sensible models here, uh, which I used in the analysis with Poisson regressions and negative binomial models because this is count data. Uh, deaths were counted in five year increments. And so this is about pro future projected deaths, right? So, I mean, existing data, we have annual death data nationally. But uh, for projections, I did it in a, you know, in a five year in increments because I mean, I just didn't have enough computing power to do it like at a more granular level. I ended up doing similar work later on with. But at the time, not at the time. Uh, I mean, basically, it was area multiplication and then direct economic costs. I used what they call VSL measures. VSL stands for value of statistical life. So, this is a uh, uh, this is a work by uh, health economists, I think, Viscusi et al. So, the values uh, 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 it's hard to say valuing life, but they, they provide a measure. So, it's easier for insurance companies or 
the government to make decisions. So, for example, Department of Transportation in the U.S. Uh, values and uh, one uh, a human life in the U.S. around somewhere around. At the time when I did it was seven point two million dollars. I think it's currently now nine million dollars. And I mean, numbers in the same range are used by uh, you know EP, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Food and Drug Administration, the other you know American agencies. Similarly, you have different values for in other countries. So India also has. I mean, so in those tables, published tables, we you have values for you know different countries, including India. Anyway, so these are some uh, temperatures. So this is mean temperatures by month. So you see dots are outliers. So you see these are box plots, obviously. So you see the highest temperatures are in the months of, and we know that, right? So it's May and uh, June. April is also pretty high. July is even high, but we know like monsoon happens in, and so it cools down a little. These are the official heat wave death numbers uh, published from the National Disaster Management Authority numbers. So we do see a trend line even though the numbers are on, seem to be on the lower end, but there is a trend line which shows increasing temperatures over the year, increasing deaths over the years. Uh, this is data from National Crime Records Bureau and uh, disaggregated by age groups. And some interesting findings here are that people in the in the economically productive age group, but on the higher higher end, so 45 to 60 year old age group, they seem to have the largest number of you know deaths uh, over the years across all years. So heat is, I mean, in, in the literature, what we see is heat deaths, heat wave deaths show a U-shaped distribution. So it's either the very young children or it's the elderly who die more. But India, it's killing off, um, you know, people in the productive age groups. So perhaps the nature of work because half of our workforce works in agriculture related occupations. So perhaps it's the nature of work or perhaps deaths in this age group are wrote, uh, reported more often. Uh, yeah. Similarly, with male and female, we see obviously higher number of male deaths happening. Uh, yeah. Uh, so now these are the projected deaths based on the exposure response. I did not show the tables for ER functions for, I did a bunch of, you know, uh, regressions looking at, you know, uh, mid, uh, summer temperatures, annual temperatures. Uh, I had multiple definitions of summer temperatures. So monthly maximum, bunch of all of them, but you know, based on you know all of those tests, I just I simplified this analysis. So this is what we are seeing. So if we are on the RCP 8.5 scenario, we are likely to see by end of the century, almost you know, 80,000, 90,000 uh, excess annual deaths direct from heat every year. Uh, uh, yeah, so, and again, so if you, uh, this, uh, projected deaths, cal uh, I calculated not from the NDMA or the reported deaths. We I used estimates of current heat deaths from uh, IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. They publish what they call the Global Burden of Disease Study. So I used I, uh, IHME estimates to project them in the future for, for the deaths. Uh, I ended up, after my PhD, I ended up working at IHME. So I then started calculating those projections. <laughs> Anyway, so I mean, across all scenarios, uh, we would see an increase in deaths, right? So if we have, and those projections are based on the current estimates. So if we have, you know, better estimates or higher estimates, the future projections are also likely to, but they are going to increase, no doubt. If you put an economic cost to it, so, I mean, yeah, I'll come to the cost later. So you could uh, see different, uh, actually this video overlaps my slides, so I actually can't see half of my slides. <laughs> So, so you see that in the median uh, population projection scenario for, I did it for like, for example, I mean, there was this bunch of numbers, so it should, you know, clarify them. So it's 2025, 2050, 2075, and 1000, end of the century. So for the median population growth scenario, we would see uh, uh, somewhere around, I mean, these numbers are deaths, so around 84,000 excess deaths in 2000. It does go down if you, I mean, it plateaus around 2075. And what we, this is because population of the country itself plateaus and then goes down later. So even though the proportion of death increases because the temperature increases, because the denominator, the population goes, it plateaus and starts to go down. And in the later projections, which I myself did at IHME, I mean, we realized that India is likely to stabilize in 2042, I think. So, uh, so that's why we are seeing uh, the plateauing of deaths. It's not because it's becoming colder. It's just because the baseline population starts to go down. But if you do this uh, and death analysis for age groups, it would be interesting because the age pyramid would then, you know, flip. So, right, it would become unstable. So, in that case, you would probably see higher deaths 
in elderly age groups. And because the proportion of elderly would be more, you would probably see uh, increased death. So we, of course, need to do more studies on, on this topic. Yeah, I'm sorry. So yeah, that's pretty much, I mean, I just showed all cause death, population estimates, bunch of numbers. Right, and you could do an economic cost to it. So what we are seeing here is a greater increase in minimum and mean temperatures than maximum temperatures. This was also something really interesting. And, and when researchers use the word interesting, that's, you know, interesting. So because uh, with, con con with, you know, continuous days of hotter temperatures, your body doesn't even get a chance to cool down. So, you know, when you have several days of higher temperatures, you're likely to see a higher, and that's what we're seeing, that those temperature increases are actually more for minimum temperatures than maximum temperatures. Uh, we are seeing a decreasing range in temperatures. Uh, that's, as I said, there is no respite at night and people are unable to control their thermal environment. They are more vulnerable. So if someone is elderly or, you know, bedridden or, you know, especially able, those kind of people, they are at risk. Uh, you know, so I said 84,000 excess deaths. And if you put an economic cost to it, that ranges between 13 to 23 billion US dollars for Indian deaths. So there is a considerable uncertainty around these numbers. This is a simple, you know, projection exercise because we don't really have really clear you know, estimates right now. Challenges, steady state assumption that the future is an extension of the past. It may as well not be, we don't know. Maybe these temperatures exceed human capacity of adaptation. So temperatures exceed a certain threshold, human body is not able to, so to, 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 know, to live through those temperatures. So then what? So maybe then deaths would, instead of going in a straight line from take an exponential you know, shape. So we don't know. There is a possible non-linear relationship. Not possible, it's a quite likely a non-linear relationship. Uh, there is an absence of district-wise, day-wise heat wave deaths by age and gender to be correlated with temperature data. And we would also need computing resources to do that kind of analysis. And there is a difficulty in characterizing human adaptation to elevated temperatures. So yes, people living in hotter areas are used to hotter temperatures, to some degree, but then what happens if you know it exceeds a certain threshold? Do we? It's not going to be a steady state. There's going to be probably some kind of a, you know, a different level of equilibrium. It's scary to think about this. Okay, so coming down to the third paper that talks about adaptation, uh, the idea was to build a general framework describing where and how those deaths occur, and then identify the intervention points and ways to intervene. Can I please quickly do a time? Oh, okay, don't forget time check. I just need to see. Okay, so I'm 30 minutes in. I'll quickly finish in you know, seven minutes. Okay, so what is that framework? So how, where and how those deaths occur? And then how can we intervene in, in that you know, progression? So to help think about this, uh, it's a whiteboarding you know, exercise. Um, I mean, it's, it's what they call systems analysis. So we're looking at exposure, looking at, uh, you know, recognition. So there are individuals, right? Individuals are exposed to, you know, sun, heat, and this denotes their health, right? So individuals, when they're exposed to sun, there could be an initial stage of exposure. It moves on to the next stage of recognition, you know, of, you know, of exposure some have ha happened. They could, uh, when they're recognized that they have been exposed to heat, they could do something at home, care, take care of themselves, or perhaps go out maybe to a hospital to, you know, to seek care. And in the hospital, they could either recover, become well and go back home, go back to the community, or they could, you know, not survive. So yeah, they could die. So they, then when you study, uh, you know, public health, if you study, you know, uh, preventive medicine, we talk about this, the idea of natural history of disease, right? And so based on the natural history of the disease, you could also think of levels of prevention. So you could do a primordial prevention so that you don't even allow that exposure to happen, right? You could do a primary prevention, which is, you know, you at the risk factor level, you could do a secondary prevention, which is basically treatment, or you could do tertiary prevention, which is basically limiting these complications, which has happened. So now I'm thinking of this flow. You could model it. I mean, it could also look like some kind of an agent-based, not agent-based, uh, compartmental model. But yeah, let's let's go ahead. Yeah. So what did I, this study was qualitative. So I did semi-structured interviews with uh, subject matter experts in India and abroad but who dealt with South Asian and Indian heat wave issues. And they included a wide spectrum of people. I reached out to a lot of people, uh, academics, climate health researchers, medical doctors, community activists, urban health plans, lawyers, policy advisors, all kinds of people. Had a bunch of thematic questions. And those questions were on the perceived, you know, 
uh, just one second, uh, scope of the problem, the everyday lived experiences of people, uh, exposure, how to do, you know, uh, recognize in-house and out-house care subgroups. Are there any groups which are which the people think or experts think are at a higher risk? For example, I mean, think of, uh, for example, women. So the way things are in India, uh, you know, quite a number of households don't have you know, are classified as slum households, right? So for example, in Ahmedabad, it was like office, census number says 9% officially, uh, SEVA report says around 25% of quarter of households, Bombay perhaps a lot, large number of households are some slum households. So by definition, they wouldn't have a separate kitchen, right? So they would be using, you know, cow dung caves or, you know, wood shavings or wood, or, or some cases, of course, gas, cooking gas, but they're cooking inside, right? So it, it heats up the indoor environment. The dresses women wear, sari and petticoat and all of that, that traps heat in, on the inside. Not having an indoor toilet means that women, uh, you know, they can't go out and relieve themselves if they don't have an indoor toilet, right? So which means that they would avoid drinking a lot of water so that they don't have to go out frequently to relieve themselves. Not having an indoor shower means they can't really take a shower, right? There's no privacy, you can't take a shower. So then are what are those subgroups, you know, people with pre-existing medical conditions, disability, gender-wise, age group, elderly. So what are those, you know, subgroups? So who are at risk from uh, from from heat? Then moving on to, uh, so these are the responses. And again, I mean, a lot of this is we, we obviously intuitively know. So it's a uniquely difficult situation. Some said experts of were of the opinion that, you know, this is heat is something. What is a not just a tip? It's a very mini tip of an iceberg. And you know, night warming is uh, greater than day, and that people found really difficult. Uh, uh, in terms of vulnerability, who was most vulnerable, according to experts, was people working, you know, in unorganized sector. They didn't really have a lot of protections you know, and, uh, you know, labor rights stuff. So unorganized sector, rural and urban poor people, uh, agricultural landscape, their studies, some of them are controversial. There was this study in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, which talks about farmer suicides with increasing temperatures. So I think for one degree rising temperature, they project around it 17,000 something excess farmer suicides. Uh, uh, air conditioning often is in, in affordable. I mean, for example, I, I'm from Lucknow, UP. So per capita income from my state is a thousand dollars, right? So and I know households often don't have a power connection or regular power supply or the ability to buy air conditioning or to pay for the increased power bills, which will come with regular use of air conditioning. So then, you know, there's a discrepancy or there is a wide spectrum of, you know, vulnerability. Some, not everyone can afford any air conditioning. Urban infrastructure often is there or lacking. Uh, we talked about women issues separately, other issues of very elderly sick. I worked in Gujarat often I saw, you know, uh, construction workers and laborers coming from far off states, for example, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Odisha. Um, they didn't even speak the local language. They didn't really have local connections or networks. So working on, you know, construction sites in the day and then, you know, uh, at night, it's, 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 it's a difficult life. Uh, so consequences, how people described was, you know, um, uh, often it was just about survival, somehow to stay alive. You know, it's like being in an oven every day, one day at a time. The goal is to live through that day medical effects documented and other studies. Some studies, I myself did it, uh, one study in Ahmedabad and there we noticed almost 10% of the construction of the, uh, you know, worker population complained of uh, medical uh, condition on any day, any single day you do, you go and work. Not here, but like some other study, I, I myself did it. So heat cramps, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, all of this on pre-existing conditions. Prime, secondary and tertiary effects were on decreased productivity on, you know, infrastructural impacts. There's a very polite way of saying that, you know, for example, if you're a construction worker, you're worker, working in a manufacturing setting, right? It's really hot, right? So often workers would not be really keen on wearing protective, in, you know, gloves and caps and hard hats and, you know, jackets because it's already so hot. So, you know, that leads to an increase in percentage in, in accidents or, you know, work site. So it, it's not just heat deaths, heat versus a lot of other things. So you have to start to think of heat as some kind of a systemic, you know, problem. And, you know, chronic diseases, chronic kidney disease, for example, or, you know, dehydration, or it worsens many pre-existing conditions. Yeah, we have seen all of this. Next. Uh, uh, in, so what could we do to, you know, uh, so we could think of interventions at different levels. You could do inter individual interventions, you could do community interventions, or you could do federal interventions, large scale, national, international interventions. So what we could do at individual, and this is just really simplistic. I mean, 
if you go into detail, I'll show you a graph. I'll not read through. I promise I will not read through that huge this one. So it lists out a bunch of interventions and quickly going through them individually, what you could do to like prevent like have education, do behavior change, housing modifications, those kind of things. Community level, you could think of, you know, urban planning, tree planting, cool roofs, those kind of things. Federal level, you could do, you know, building infrastructure, heat labor, all of those things. Uh, what do you do when you you are ill from heat sickness so individually drink plenty of water home treatment staying cool all of those things ac fan medical care whatever community level you know ors packet distribution water conservation those kind of things federal level again you know outreach ndma those kind of things uh, some issues which come across in this study are that adaptation suggestions seem to go against climate implications if you start if everyone in india's Flips on air conditioning, which happened in China in, in, within two decades, their air conditioning usage increased from 5% to almost 100%. So that, but also because our energy is being produced majority from fossil fuel and coal, so that, you know, worsens, you know, emissions. Uh, so the challenge is to find win-win. And, you know, not everything is that sad, is, is that depressing, because, like, if you step back and think about this for a second, I was the first person in my family to use to benefit from air conditioning. My father was the first person in my in his family to, to ever use electric fan, right? But parts of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, and you know, these have been since millennia, uh, you know, quite densely populated, uh, you know, parts of the country. And India itself has historically been, and even now, like uh, the largest country by population. So I'm sure there are ways, there have been ways where people live through since millennia, centuries, with in in high temperatures, so so it's I mean we have to think about this. How do we you know live through those? So the policy implications in terms of air pollution is the last slide I promise is where and when to focus. Some parts of the country will be affected more than others. I showed in the heat hotspots, the heat index. Rural and urban poor have unique exposure and vulnerability. Something to keep in mind: urban areas we know about, you know urban heat island effects, and this is different from rural areas. Lifestyles are different. You can do your fields, work in your fields early in the morning and late at night in rural areas. You can't really change office timings in urban areas as much. I mean, it happens. Uh, males in the working age group I highlighted are dying more. Deaths will increase in the future and plateau out, and I explained why. What to do about this, reduce those humans and those impacts. Adaptation requires a combination of strategies. We have to think in terms of systems, subgroups, they need special attention. I talked about, highlighted the issue of women, about you know, uh, you know, different subgroups, and also a lot of bottoms up ethnographic research is needed because, or uh, maybe this is my own blindness where I come from. My training is in medicine, public health. I did my MBBS, MD in community medicine. I did a fellowship in industrial health, uh, MPH in public health, uh, post uh, MPhil and PhD in public policy. So, but I was approaching this from a very quantitative angle. So I haven't, but I've looked for. And I haven't really found a lot of ethnographic research on heat. I mean, some of the interesting work has been US military documenting historical during colonial times practices of you know how people used to live through heat, but there is not a lot of you know ethnographic research. Yeah, I'll not read through this, I promise. So this uh, so this again looks at individual community and federal levels from exposure to recognition to treatment and outside care, what you could do individually. So think in terms of systems. So yeah, that was my committee. My professors, Gary was an anthropologist. Rafael is a mathematical mathematician, infectious disease modeler. Jamie is a public health specialist. She developed uh, New York's uh, high plan and she's currently a professor at Hopkins. And uh, Shubayu was a director at Citizen Disease Control. So yeah, so this was my work. Uh, Eric Kleinberg uh, is said to have done a lot of sociological work on, this, on the Chicago heat wave. So he's a very famous quote from Silent and Invisible Killer of Silenced and Invisible People. That's heat. Yep. So yeah, that's all I had to say. Yeah, thank you. I don't want to go through black of sites. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank should I switch up the yes, speech here? Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for your uh, enlightening presentation. And now uh, we will take some questions. So there are a couple of questions in the Q&A box. The first question is by Prakash Ji. The question is that uh, heat wave affects the productivity of both individual and organization. And what should the uh, corporate sector do about it in order to... Uh, uh, gear up for this increasing peril. I mean, there, again, so first point which I try to remind people over and over again is 
that when you think of heat, don't think it, uh, think of it, think in terms of systems, right? Larger, think in terms of a systems perspective, right? So what could be done? I mean, you could start thinking of everything about a worker's health in terms of, you know, if you do this industrial health approach, you know, so then you're looking at work site, you would make sure that, you know, there, there is an ambient temperature where people are working. Uh, you know, you make sure that, you know, availability of water or taking rest that is available there locally on the work site. There are worker wellness programs you could measure on site temperatures in real time. There are these, uh, in, in the US, there used to be what they call, I think they've changed. It's called ACGIH. Uh, threshold so American Council for Government Industrial Hygienists. So they suggest that based on this combination of uh, temperature and humidity, uh, so they have this bunch of indices. And let's not even go there. Heat index, humid index, WBGT, this, that, whatever. So based on these indices, they have these thresholds. So if index is below a certain threshold, please don't quote me on this. I forgot those numbers, less than 28 something. So then you can work for an hour and take a break off like sometime. If it exceeds 34, for example, then you're not supposed to work at all. If it's between 13 and 34, you take like equal amounts of work and break time. So, so you follow those kind of you know guidelines. You make sure this you know healthcare facilities are available, water supply is provided, workers are given adequate break time, all of that. So I think uh, you know those uh, kind of things would be really and, and workers would appreciate you know because it would also reduce accidents, increase productivity, those kind of things at the work site. So I think that should work. I'm afraid that Jean's asking why morbidity cost is difficult to calculate. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, so when we uh, mobility, the challenge with this, how do you like what? How do you attribute? You know, what extent of mobility do you attribute to heat? So, for example, someone has uh, you know hypertension, pre-existing condition, which limits to some degree their. Uh, you know, uh, limits to some degree their performance, their activity, their everyday health. And then heat on top of that pre-existing conditions makes it worse. So then how do you, you know, what fraction of that loss would you attribute to heat versus, and then there are ways to do it, right? It's not that we have, we don't know that. So there are three ways of doing it. So one is what they call a visual analog scale. So you ask people, to you know, point out and draw a line and say, okay, this much to this much, I'm worried about heat and, and this much. There is another one called time, time trade-off. So how much of your time are you willing to give up in terms of, um, in, in return of getting you know, something, a good health. And third one is called standard gamble. So visual analog scale, time trade-off, stand, standard gamble. So you could do a standard gamble, you know, and, and these measures do approximate, but we do need to, you know, to work more on, on in fact, there's some really interesting pathways which are coming out in terms of heat. So for, again, this is unpublished work, but heat apparently increases drowning cases in, in Africa. And I have no idea why it does that, but there seem to be. So we do need to look at those, you know, larger data sets using a systems approach. You know, a lot of relationships are, uh, are there out there, yeah. Uh, if Shitaji is asking, does repeated exposure to heat, extreme heat conditions over long periods uh, lead to adaptability? Is the human threshold of absorbing heat the major concern here? Yeah, that's what I keep thinking. So in the US, for example, uh, people living in Alaska are used to colder temperatures. People living in Arizona and Texas are used to living in hotter temperatures, right? And so, for example, I live in Seattle and I, I mean, there is a heat alert going on for the entire you know, region for the, and the temperature is 34 degrees centigrade. I am from Lucknow, UP. Temperatures there like exceed 45, 47 degrees centigrade. So 34 seeing a heat alert, you know, because people are adapted to these temperatures. So the question then is, is there a threshold effect that you know, up to a certain increase in temperatures, people would be able to live through that. And then after that, it stops happening. So if you think about this, with 100% humidity, like as a physician, right? You know, fever happens when your core body temperature exceeds 96 point something degree Fahrenheit or 36 you know, degrees centigrade. So if your outside temperature is more than that, you don't have access to a fan or air conditioning. Fan wouldn't work anyway if there is 100% humidity outside and you don't have access to air conditioning. So how, how would someone cool down? And 
I just don't understand. I've been thinking about this for trust me years. So I am of the opinion that to some degree humans will be able to adapt, but perhaps there is a threshold effect. After a certain temperature, humans perhaps, again, I'm speculating, I still haven't done those studies, but perhaps after a certain threshold that, that doesn't work. And maybe the lifestyle we are living these days, you know, because now indoors we have air conditioning, our car is air conditioned. So then perhaps we are not exposed to those temperature extremes. So our adaptation is actually declining. Temperatures are increasing, but because now we have access to air conditioning, our own body's capacity to live through temperature extreme perhaps is going down. And that's differential. So if you can afford air conditioning, your adaptation goes down. If you can't afford air conditioning, then perhaps not. But yeah, so it's, it's a, again, complex question. We will have to probably do subgroup analysis for individual you know, groups by income, by neighborhood. I'm sorry, so, I'm taking longer. So there are like a couple of questions more, but uh, we are running out of time. So I'll club a few uh, questions together and uh, give it to you. Uh, one question is like, does uh, heat uh, affect uh, uh, people uh, and expose them to like uh, diseases like cardiovascular uh, ailments? Is, uh, working, uh, is working hours during sunlight uh, will help in mitigating the heat, heat risk? Okay, so two questions here. So when you look at uh, data, I'll answer it very quickly. So look at, uh, for example, emergency room admissions, for example, in California. So what they're seeing is during the days when there is a heat alert out there, you see far more admissions for cardiovascular respiratory causes. So heat versus for example, pre-existing cardiovascular conditions. Somebody already has a heart disease and now, I mean, they're, they're, they're physiologically stressed out, but they can live with it. And now suddenly it's so hot that now their body just gives up and now they're admitted in the hospital. So it worsens it. Uh, what's the second question? I'm sorry. What was the second part of the question? Sir, so even I have lost that question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, yes. What is differences between RCP 4.5 and 8.5? So RCP, it's, it's an acronym for representative concentration pathway. So these RCPs were used, uh, I mean, they're defined by the IPCC, International the Climate Change People. And they talk, I mean, they, they're not temperature increases, right? They're, they're a measure of what they call radiative forcing. So in a, in a limited area, how much radiation or temperature or something happens. So, so based on these, they model out, I mean, they have a bunch of assumptions behind each of these RCPs. So, you know, for example, RCP 8.5 is nation states are uh, become stronger, less global collaboration happens. So then each state does, and then they imagine a future based on that. And so then what temperature, what would be the temperature increase based on that future? So, I mean, these are imaginary futures. So what they call RCPs, there are also, you can also read more about what they call integrated assessment models. So they are also something like that, yeah. I mean, so you could how, simply calculate. I mean, it's not bad. You could simply just take the emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, gigatons, and there is a definite temperature. So you do carbon intensity, carbon emissions, global emissions, cumulative emissions, emissions to temperature anomaly. So by how many gigatons would increase temperatures by so much? A temperature anomaly to mortality, to morbidity, to economic cost. You could do an entire pathway and it's it's doable. I mean, just need a com big computer to do it. So how do you develop a sustainable thinking in rural area for a sustainable future? I think, again, my personal opinion, this is not backed by research. We Indians are Gandhian in terms of the way we live our lives, I mean, especially in rural areas. There's so little amount of you know, waste we produce, so little energy per capita we consume, our emissions. So all of that, I think we are already, we are the examples for you know, uh, many countries to how to you know, live sustainably, especially the, the Indian population living in rural areas. So I don't think they can, we can probably become any more, you know, I mean, of course there is, you know, for improvement. Yes. Uh, so still we have so many questions, but uh, unfortunately we don't have so much time uh, to spare on the Q&A round. Uh, I would like to thank you once again, sir, for uh, taking up all the questions and having this lively discussion. 
with us and uh, joining us from so far away from the US. In Seattle must be <laughs> really late out there. So uh, I wish you a uh, good evening, sir, and uh, hope uh, we'll have a uh, future deliberation once again with you. So how about that? I am available on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. Just Google my name. It should Something should come up. Sure, sir. Please just write to me. Just copy, paste, and email me this. I promise I will get back to you. Okay? Sure. Sir. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. My ID is Gulraiz Doc. Gulraiz, D-O-C. Right. Tikendar, sir. Thank you. Tikendar, sir, would you like to add anything? I'm sorry, in what? I couldn't get you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Gulrez. It was really fascinating to, thank you. Uh, uh, for, I mean, to you uh, have uh, in this panel and, you know, to start the day with your presentation. Um, I think uh, uh, probably what we can do, uh, Dr. Sarvi, is all the questions, we can just uh, mail it to uh, Dr. Gulrez so that yes, he can sir. reply it on the... Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe on the chat box or maybe, so that we are able to respond to the participants because I'm so happy that you know, there's a large number of participants who are attending this uh, webinar, right, since yesterday, yes. there's another day to come. And uh, also because some of these questions were posed to me yesterday and I I, mean, I just kept them on hold because ask, asking them to just wait for our experts, particularly from the health perspective. And uh, I'm happy that Dr. Gulrez uh, uh, brings in that perspective and, of course, bridges that gap. So thank you, Dr. Gulrez. And uh, I think what the suggestions that you made for the policy uh, paradigm, you know, uh, particularly for uh, you know, identifying the vulnerable spots, and uh, you know, uh, I think that that's something very interesting. From that, that can be uh, uh, one of the ways, uh, one of the one of the important uh, uh, you know interventions that can be done. So thank you, Dr. Bullrace. I think uh, we can go ahead. So we and please just mail these questions to uh, Dr. Bullrace so that sure, sir. Uh, just take some time, Dr. Bullrace, and just respond to them. I mean, our participants will be absolutely happy to. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Tikender, sir, uh, for the uh, remarks. Now uh, we will move ahead with the second session uh, of our day two uh, training program. The uh, second distinguished expert uh, is Professor Joy Shri Roy. Professor Roy is Banga Bandhu Chair Professor and Director, Center on South and Southeast Asia Multidisciplinarily Allied Research Network on Transforming Societies of Global South, AIT School of Environment, Resource and Development, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. Ma'am is joining us from Bang Bangkok. We welcome you, ma'am, to this program. So, it's Professor, please... Professor Joy yes, yes ma'am. Welcome, okay. welcome ma'am. Um, yeah. Please take over the session. Thank you very much for introducing me. And I was also listening to the earlier um, speaker. So, some of it might be uh, overlapping, but sometimes we say in research, multiple views on a particular um, a finding strengthens uh, the um, results or strengthens uh, the, um, the conclusions. So I think, I mean, even if there are some overlaps with what uh, uh, Dr. Gulrez said, but it will be, I hope, it will be useful. So let me share the screen. And what, I, what I'm going to talk about today is um, uh, with, the, uh, with the rising heat stress, how the health risk is increasing and how we need to be thinking about uh, the um, health service provision in India. So I'll try to focus more on Indian perspective. I'll try to focus more on Indian perspective and um, let me proceed with that. But then I start with the um, a global uh, consideration because what we need to understand is that this climate system and climate variability are a global phenomena. So the temperature is uh, how the global atmosphere behaves. So it's just not about a national perspective. So we need to understand that climate conversation is now at the point where 
we are talking at a time when we are living in 1.1 degree warmer world compared to the pre-industrial level. This uh, has been established scientifically with confidence by the India um, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, in its latest report, which uh, published in this year. So uh, what we are saying is that in IPCC report that now, because we are already in a warmer world, so every bit of additional warming will matter. And every year, if it is rising, that will also matter. And so how do we make our choices about our action would even more um, important. So the whole discussion is that how can we accelerate the climate action so that uh, which is very critical to the sustainable development, keeping this generation and coming generation in view. We also know from the latest IPCC report that how different ecosystems are how different, um, I mean, natural and the managed and the human systems are going to be impacted. And of these, if I just look at here, what it says is that heat related morbidity and mortality is going to rise. And these um, uh, colors are showing the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the level of danger or level of risk. Danger means level of risk for uh, the human systems. So the darker the shade, very high the impact is. And if it is white, then it is undetectable impact. But this is something in the 1.5 report, it was made very clear and which has been strengthened further in the uh, assessment report six, which came out this year, early this year, that heat related morbidity and mortality are going to be uh, increasing as we move towards higher and higher temperature. And when we talk of higher and higher temperature, what we are saying is that basically we are at 1.1 degree Celsius rise. So say for example, we are almost here. So that's why we are saying that we, whatever we are seeing is still moderate impact on the um, uh, heat system that we are seeing or heat related morbidity and mortality, which we are seeing. But if we cross 1.5 degree or two degree Celsius, then it is really going to be even more higher and it's going to be crossing the danger limit and what was discussed in the earlier session also whether humans will be able to adapt or ecosystems will be able to adapt or not we know that many ecosystem will not be able to adapt so for example the warm water corals will not be able to adapt even at this a temperature rise of 1.1 degree, uh, there is um, a very high risk to the coral systems, which we all know, but we are now talking about the uh, human system today. So I'll not go into this, but then we know that um, one thing I just want to um, highlight, which is important for India is that mangrove system is more resilient compared to many other systems like the terrestrial ecosystem, Arctic or small island or the coastal flooding and all these we are considering about or even the agricultural crop. In this is I'm showing that which has been come up with in 2018 and then has been confirmed in 2022. And this is the knowledge we actually we had in 20, 2015 itself from the Stern Review Report, which shows that how with increasing temperature, how the uh, risks to the different systems will be rising. So this is the same thing I just wanted to show that. So assessment of risk to different systems is already known and we all know that. So what really matters is that how do we uh, respond to this? because this is a scientific information that we have now. And so how, how this science can inform us in taking action that has become more important because there is increasing confidence 
in the scientific results of these findings. So um, there, there is a not increasing doubt, but they're increasing confidence and strengthened um, uh, uh, responses. So really what it depends is that, as we said, if it is a sustainable development, which we are talking about, and if we are talking about planning for sustainable development, then understanding the climate change related health, in, uh, health impact and understanding how it impacts the sustainable development is extremely important. I'll share with you some of our, some old studies for India which we tried to do for different states, looking into the official statistics, we looked into a number of indicators. So I'm not going in details of that, but they are almost close to you know, 34 to 38 to 40 indicators. And some of those were categorized under social and environmental and economic, which is a standard following the standard procedure which is um, done. So we looked into these and then we tried to compare that how these are changing over time and how, uh, uh, how uh, the, uh, the, 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 the social dynamics is changing. Social dynamics in the sense that how the social priorities, environmental priorities and economic priorities are changing over time dynamically depending on how things are changing, um, you know, I mean, globally also. <clears throat> and we find that the environmental concerns are becoming more and more prominent in many states, although they were also the similar for many other states, but relatively now, although we are trying to solve our social and economic problems, but then environmental problems are becoming more and more prominent. And when we looked into the deeper uh, side of it, I'm just showing one uh, uh, figure for one year, but then what I'm, we are trying to, so we did it decadal. So what it shows is that if we look into these environmental indicators, which of the environmental indicators rank one, if we look into the priority in the sense that which indicator is pulling down the, sustainable development indicator for India. We found that if we look into these, these are all either diarrhea, or malaria, or uh, heat related diseases. So all these are health related indicators. So basically what we find is that health related indicators are becoming, uh, is really the prominent one which is holding back India's sustainable development. So if we look into that, then what really matters is that if we are really planning for sustainable development for India, we need to focus on health related issues. And that determines not only the individual well-being, but also the societal well-being. And if we look further, then we see that climate change induced health impacts put uh, more stress on human well-being. So already what I'm trying to say is that our study shows that we have published also these. What it shows is that already it is stressed in terms of already the sustainable development programs in India are stressed because of poor performance in the health sector. Now with climate changing and which we know is going to change, and it has already changed 1.1 degree, but that's a global surface temperature. That's not 1.1 degree everywhere, right? So some stay, some cities, it might be four degree rise. Some cities, it may be two degrees rise. In the mountains, it is more than four or five degrees Celsius rise. So it, it varies, but mean surface temperature has gone up 1.1 degree Celsius already. So we, what we are saying is that with that mean surface temperature rise, already we can see that climate change induced health impacts will be even more because already we are doing uh, wars in the health sector. And that will lead to more intergenerational and intragenerational health problems. And which we'll, we will see that unless we have preventive 
healthcare approach just by thinking that what if this happens, what more we can do in terms of cure system, that means medical infrastructure system. I want to preempt this, but we will show it later that that is not going to solve the problem because the infrastructure and everything will run short off if we allow this to continue and think that we will be taking care of, we'll be adapting whether medically or infrastructurally, that's not going to be possible. So this is really, there are adaptation limits, which IPCC report of this year has clearly showed that it is not that human system or the natural ecosystem can go on adapting to any level of, um, uh, 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 I mean, uh, the temperature rise. So this is something which is extremely important. We need to understand that India will fail in sustainable development achievement. Only if we look at the human health sector, we will not be able to achieve the sustainable development in the longer run. I'm not talking about 2030 goals, but we need to, I mean, the world continues, India continues being 2030 also, so we should really look in the longer term. And from that point of view, what we try to show is that uh, <coughs> if we look into climate change related potential health impact, then we see that if there is frequency and intensity of heat wave, then we know that um, the mortality will increase and especially those who are impoverished. And also what we need to understand is that allergy pattern will change, change in the distribution of allergy will be changing over time. And also the infectious disease and vector-borne disease is going to change. So what I want to say is that we are talking only of heat wave now, but there are going to be multiple hazards coming together, not only heat wave, increasing allergy, increasing burden of infectious diseases, increased air pollution, um, and then there will be loss of agricultural yield, which will lead to more malnutrition. And so what we want to say is that waterborne diseases will also increase. And from all this point of view, what I want to say is that just focusing on heat and heat related um, diseases or human health issues and thinking of policy only for one disaster will be a major mistake. Um, uh, uh, globally, definitely, but I'm talking more about Indian perspective. So from that point of view, we need to really prepare for the multiple climate-related, disease-related hazards that will be coming. And I'm just saying that this is on top of what we showed earlier, the map, which India is already facing the health-related um, uh, uh, stresses already. So if we look into the, uh, I, I just uh, uh, try to say that in the national communication of India, which India makes um, uh, to the UNFCCC, even in 2004, we identified what are these diseases and why we need to be attending to those. So what I'm trying to say is that imagine 2004 to 2021, almost 20 years, two decades we are talking about this. But really what is really needed earlier, it was more understanding the problem. But now it is more, it needs to be more solution centric um, approaches, what we need to be talking about. So if we look into the risk factor and um, you know, who will be, impacted more, we made a study, and then we came up with these results, which we showed that the vulnerable population, which are uh, a, a vulnerable population are going to be the majorly the elderly people over 50, over 50 years of age, because they, uh, they have impaired cognitive function also, and also the poor, uh, thermoregulatory mechanism. These lead to higher risk factor. 
And for children, so what I want to say is that not that every individual or every group of individual or section of people will be impacted in the same way. So the approach needs to be the uh, you know, a social demographic group wise also the action needs to be thought of. So if it is elderly, it needs to be different approach. If it is children, then it needs to be um, a, a, a different approach. So um, the children actually need more time to acclimatize than the adults. And um, so, uh, I mean, children have less physiological capacity to, for sweating because that sometimes helps us in cooling our body. So that is also less. So we need to understand that children have different kind of risk compared to the elderly people. And if someone is participating in athletic events, they usually face the problem of dehydration. So we need to be um, conscious about how the outdoor sports, outdoor games, in which months and how these needs to be, um, uh, um, I mean, uh, adjusted or adapted with the changing climate. And then also we need to understand that outdoor workers, if you think of our India, then we have huge number of informal sector workers like street vendors, rickshaw pullers, poor and uh, subsistence farmers and pastorials. They really have inadequate cooling off or rest period and insufficient water consumption. So they suffer a lot from dehydration and they have inappropriate clothing and excessive exposure to the outdoor temperature. This really, and on top of that, we do have, as I said, initially I showed you the baseline of India of health uh, situation. So they have already malnutrition and that really leads to uh, a difficult problem. And medically compromised and socially isolated people will have more problem. So we need to be thinking that how different social groups need to be attended or need to be approached in terms of heat related. And but I, as I said, and I repeatedly will say this, that it's just not heat, but the multiple cascading health related um, danger and the risks which can come from the uh, climate change. And so what we need to understand that impact of heat stress, as I said, demographically it varies, but also it varies occupational category wise. And when we talk of occupational category wise, we actually did a study to do, uh, to define uh, human workability. And uh, while, um, I mean, the wet bulb glow temperature indicator development. So if we have different relative humidity and the temp uh, humidity and the temperature levels, then we can actually draw this. I'm not going in details of this research, but this is already published and a book is going to come out. And where we are trying to show that we can draw actually the combination of humidity and the temperature level and can show what is the 100% workability zone for in, um, uh, human beings and uh, for the outdoor workers, what I'm showing now, because this can be done for all kinds of workers. We have done it, but I'm just showing for outdoor workers because I'm concerned that we have more people working outdoors in India and then many other countries. And so uh, their workability zone and 0% work workability zone. 0% workability zone means you should just lie down. You should not be doing even a little bit of work because that will create your health problem. What we are saying is that it that will lead to some different kind of morbidity, which may not be immediately observable, but will have a long-term impact like diabetic, then also heat cramps and many other heat rashes and many other uh, you know, uh, um, diseases can happen. So, and in between these are 75%, 
50% and 25% working workability zone. So uh, already in many occupation category, say for example, I know that in marine, um, uh, um, uh, in the ships, when people travel, there are rules depending on the WBGT index parameter, which they measure, they suggest people when they should be taking how much rest and how much time they should be working because that has a health impact and they are all insured. So this has a different meaning, what is going to be the medical cost for them. So there is a whole defined uh, uh, work rest regime uh, defined for them. So what we tried to do, I'm just showing an example. We tried to do actually these four, four mega cities of India, uh, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Chennai, and Kolkata. And uh, we took uh, actually 60 years of data from um, Indian Meteorological Department. And then we tried to plot them and try to see what it means if I take the observed data and then if I define the workability zone. So we, I'm showing this for Calcutta City just to show you, demonstrate you how we can interpret these results. So what it means, these dots, blue dots are actually the uh, daily temperature and humidity combination, right? So in the month of May, and this we did for 2015. And so we took that data and then we actually updated this later also. And so what we tried, we tried that this is the baseline. That means if we take whole month of May in 2015, then if this is the workability, non-workability zone, then these are the dots which shows that actually no one in Kolkata should be working because the all day and night, the temperatures are such that each of these dots fall in the no workability zone without any adaptation, right? So this is the baseline. And then what we tried to do was we gave up the different, uh, we uh, made, made various simulations and we tried to give different adaptation. So we are saying that this is only for the outdoor workers. Again, I am saying we have done it for different categories of occupation categories. So what we tried to see is that if we change just the clothing type, right? And then we see that only two days come to 50. So what it means, if you give adaptation, your workability zone moves up. And which means your days come within a, work, a workability zone, but this is still 25% and 50%, not to the 100%, right? And then we gave even more, right? So we gave indoor workspace to all. If we give indoor, uh, okay, I, I'll give another. So this is suppose we gave shades to the outdoor workers. If we give shade to the outdoor workers, okay, only three days still come in. And if we give indoor workspace to all, sorry, if we give indoor workspace to all, then we see that still some more come. And then what happens? You get some dots actually. Most, most of them are almost here. Only uh, seven, eight are in the non-workability zone. But then many of them actually now are coming in the 100% workability zone, right? So that's why, why we need shades. And without shade, we need not be working uh, in, in this summer month. So from these, we can see what should be the policies, what should be the uh, recommendations, what should be the solutions that we should be looking at. So we ran this simulation and we did it for many countries, many, many, as I said, for all four mega cities. And what we found is that if we look into all the years and all the uh, coming years, uh, sorry, all the, all the years we actually on 2015, then we find that if we look into Kolkata, 357 days without adaptation, no one should be working. In Delhi, 340 
three days, actually no one should be working. Mumbai, 362 days and Chennai, 345 days. What it means? It means, but you will ask me that, yeah, people still work. Yes, people work. And that takes a toll on their health. And that's why they have several other uh, uh, physiological problems and medical problems, which we do not attribute to heat related stress because we have not thought it in that way because there is dehydration. We just say that, okay, dehydration, but why dehydration? We never ask that, right? So we are not looking into those. And so we are not taking right approaches for giving adaptation. So remember, these are the baseline. So if we give these adaptation, then there will be some more days where one can be working. But we saw that only when you can have 100% work days for all cities are if you have an air conditioned space. Only if you have an air conditioned space, then only you have 100% workability zone. But now I'll be, um, I, I, I mean, I just ask myself that, uh, so what percentage of people have access to the air conditioned space? And from that point of view, even if 20% in a few days back when 2015, we were working, there were 10% of people who can afford um, any time uh, air conditioned spaces, but the 90% cannot. And which simply means that there is no uh, possibility of getting 100% workability with better health, with good health. That's the most important, right? You might be working, but with your morbidity going up and which is leading to disease burden and in the long run, many health related issues. So basically we tried to do an economic estimation of the costs and we found that if we give different kind of these adaptations, the simulation, which I said, if we give these, then what are the range of costs? So these are the thousand rupees. Um, so which means that um, for reduction of 10% or 20% or 100%, this is the adapt, uh, this is the cost of providing air conditioned space. And these are different changes. So what we can do, we can think that how different cost ladders are increasing and how much adaptation you can give. But one thing is true by defining dress code in the workplaces, we can actually reduce uh, the heat stress. But also what I want to say is that remember, we are talking of climate change also. So air conditioning means more emission also because our electricity is not all um, zero carbon electricity. So basically there will be even more warming. So how to bring in adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development together has become a major, major concern as, as more and more we talk about these heat-related uh, issues. And then what we tried to do was this, this work we were actually doing for um, national communication uh, of um, uh, government of India also and many other uh, research which we had been doing for quite a long time. And so what we tried to do is that we tried to develop a framework that how we need to solve it, right? Because we have to look at the cost of solution also, because uh, uh, the finance is not free, money is not free and is not affordable. So if you have very costly adaptation strategy, then it will not be um, accessible to everybody. So that's something which is really matter. So what we try to take a conceptual framework is that if we look into these, then basically this direct heat stress. And also I forgot to include one more slide where I we actually did um, a water sample and different months in a year with the uh, increasing heat my, microbial um, uh, interaction increases in the water and the water quality deteriorates. So what, and that's why the waterborne diseases also increases. So what we found is that very interestingly, that if we take some preventive measure so that the exposure itself reduces. What we are talking vulnerability when we are talking, we are talking as if let's be exposed, let's suffer, and then let's do something. 
But what we are saying is that how can we reduce exposure level itself? And that can be a preventive action. So preventive action, for preventive action, we can enter at this point so that the direct heat stress, non-communicable disease or the communicable disease, both can be reduced because we know both leads to health damage, they lead to loss of human productivity, human health benefit, and that leads to, leads to uh, a lower human well-being. So we thought that solution can be the, the solution space, which we are talking about for very long time. One is preventive care and another one is cure, right? So medical treatment-based system, so which means that you have a health damage and then you go for cure. So here you need huge infrastructure, hospital bed, hospitalization, appropriate. Um, uh, I mean, uh, if you remember in France a few years back, I mean, in our country, every day it happens, it never becomes a news. But then in France, there were 10,000 people, old people died actually, because they could not move them from home to the hospitals and their homes do not have air conditioning. So people just died out of heat stroke in their homes. So what it means is that you cannot allow this health damage to happen and then cure because there will be a threshold and which will not be possible for people to adapt at all. So we need to think of prevention and this will be much, our results show that they are much cheaper than the cure measure, but this is something which we need to understand. And our proposal for a very long time are that we really need to think of national preventive health care mission. And why I say national preventive health care mission is that because we already have national climate um, action mission in the mission mode. And so we can include national preventive health care mission into that, and then that can move together in an integrative way. And to do that, we know that this is necessary. This is not, I mean, this is not that an option, but this is essential to ensure sustainable development in India and also to address the emerging health risk in cost-effective way and to integrate and strengthen traditional scientific practices. And in this, what I want to say is that we propose to, uh, when we submitted this report to government of India, one of the ministries where we tried to say that what we need is that, as I said, national preventive healthcare system. This may be too small for you to read, but what I'm just going to explain is that. So we want to say that to ensure, so there needs to be different, uh, um, uh, uh, different uh, approaches to solve this. And just to tell you that to ensure the sustainable development in India and to address the emerging health risks, in cost-effective way, we need an integrated approach, as I said, but also because we want to integrate our modern system, modern medical system or healthcare system, which is again, I said, cure-based system with our, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, traditional scientific practices. And um, what are these, uh, uh, traditional scientific practices. This is something which we need to important to understand, right? So this, uh, why I said that it should be in the mission mode because it can facilitate, start, uh, I mean, um, sustainable development process to targeted preventive action that can reduce the impact on health and to a large extent reduce the, um, and the pressure on health infrastructure, because this is already only for cure-based solution. So that cannot handle the, uh, the, the pressure that will be coming from climate-related health problems. So the goal, uh, our, our goal was to say that there needs to be a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral and um, a multiple health system approach. I said that we have to take the cascading um, effect of the different uh, health um, impacts of climate change. And what it means is that um, you know, we do have many traditional preventive measures. And say, for example, <coughs> sorry,
<clears throat> Ayush is a system which we already have. And <coughs> sorry, but I want to say water. Ma'am, you can have some water. Then yeah, then. yeah, sorry. Yeah. So what we are saying is that, so basically what we need to do is that the traditional uh, approach about, we, we did many of these adaptation strategies. Say for example, your house needs to be built in such a way that you can have less heat stress related impact indoor. Also, you can orient your house, so architectural design of the buildings, and also what kind of food, what kind of um, work practices you will be doing, what is the clothing type you will be using. So we can look into those and also dietary pattern determines how much heat you can, uh, the body can resist. So all these things, if we look into, then we will see that actually, if you see post-1947 Indian health, health policy, we will see that that encouraged actually the worst Western system of modern pharmaceuticals. Of course, we do need it. We do need cure health system, but too much of patronage to that system, what it did was it pushed away the traditional system and traditional system became marginalized. And because of that marginalization, we lost many of this traditional knowledge of managing uh, the, uh, the preventive health care. We understand many of the preventive health care. We know that, okay, when it is really hot, okay, we will take an umbrella and we will go. In many countries, they do not know because they do not have this problem and they did not understand that, right? So how much to, and what kind of clothing to wear when we have uh, uh, hot days? So there are several, and when to take a rest, so um, in many uh, uh, hot cities in India, we had a system of one or two hours of break during the noon time. We just took away all those and we followed a global pattern of 10 to five working hours. Those are not the right approaches. Mm, so we need that. to be thinking of those uh, alternatives. And if we look into those, then we will see that many of our adaptive actions can come from these traditional knowledge which are already there. So what I was saying is that we proposed and we showed that how the different systems can be integrated and how the Ayush which started in the ninth five-year plan, how we can strengthen it and mainstream it with the cure system so that the burden of disease can be prevented by traditional system so that on the cure system, there will be less burden. And that's how we can manage in India, the large population and the large impact. So we will have many, many approaches to do this. But what I'm just saying is that I'll stop here and I'll say that the, uh, I, I believe that without a uh, combination of um, preventive healthcare and the cure system, we will not be able to approach or we will not be able to face even the burden that we'll be facing um, as we move forward in the uh, heat stress related problem. Not only heat stress, as I said, climate related, disease related issues. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Roy, uh, for your enlightening presentation and helping us understand the key intricacies involved in the challenges uh, of heat waves. We have some questions uh, in the Q&A box, ma'am. So I'll just read it out for you. Prakash Ji is asking, um, heat wave affects uh, different social groups and uh, how do you see the plight of women and the newborns in India amidst uh, the uh, rise in poverty and uh, overcrowded cities? Yeah, we actually did a uh, uh, study on the uh, women and also the children. So just to give one example, you know, women spend, um, I mean, suppose those women who spend 
they are 24 hours uh, because they are homemakers, then they spend their large chunk of time in the kitchen. And we actually do all these measurements also. Kitchens are four to six degrees warmer than any other room in your home. Remember that, right? And when we buy a air conditioner or we have a fan, we never think of kitchen to be cooled because we th think that that needs to be hot. But then women spend the time there. So you can imagine what is the heat stress on their body. And um, uh, if you think of the newborn, they are also all the time home. They will be home. They will not be mobile. So any heat stress, any temperature rise will be impacting them. And as I said, even the children have less acclimatization. So that goes even to the newborn. That's why I say there is going to be an intergenerational health problem, which we are not looking at right now. And given the poverty, this is going to be even worse because of the malnutrition. So if we just bring in all these, you can see the accumulated uh, a health burden, if we make an estimate of that, we have not done this yet. If we do this accumulated health burden, preventive health care, without that, you cannot solve through your medical system or the cure system. That means, uh, like, like, you know, in our environmental economics, we say that you pollute and then end, at the end of the pipe, you clear it. That's not the solution we have seen in terms of air pollution also, that's not the solution, right? We need to prevent the pollution coming out at the beginning. So that's the preventive healthcare. Without, without that in India, I do not see a solution. Ikandesa, would you like to add? Yes, excellent, I think, excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Joyshree, uh, because uh, uh, when you were speaking about walkability and walkable zone, actually, this reminds me, uh, because, you know, uh, the cities are one of the important stakeholders. I mean, I don't use that term stakeholder, but yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one of the important uh, uh, spaces. Sufferer, place, and, sufferer and the emitter. <laughs> actually. So uh, I remember, you know, this is something that was uh, uh, conceived by the Koreans. I mean, I remember an old friend of mine who was the mayor of Seoul, Park Won Sun. You know, this whole concept of, uh, uh, I mean, what, what we call uh, workable cities, they termed as decent work cities. You know? So I think it is high time that uh, we have to bring on board uh, uh, the elected representatives of the towns and the cities so they have hardly anything to do in it because now with the new four labor codes, uh, most of it comes under the domain of the state governments. Uh, but nevertheless, I think because cities are important spaces, so if we could just create that environment or maybe just build some capacities of our city governments, uh, asking them, I mean, this is something astonishing that I came to know you. I mean, when, when, you, when you were speaking about the Calcutta population, eh? actually, not even a single person should work. I mean, that, uh, that is the. Uh, no, not only uh, Calcutta. Look at the Mumbai is worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, but, but yeah. So <laughs> I think it's, humidity, it's high you know? time that we just start thinking about the large informal sector that exists in the city. Yeah, you know. And who do not is... have, uh, you know, I mean, the asset holding capacity, we know the, yeah. the Oxfam report that is screaming at us time and again. So maybe decent work city could be one of the ways in which we can intervene. And since we work with city governments, Arjun, probably we can just bring them on board and ask them, hey, what are you doing here? At least let's, yeah. let's build some environment. Yeah. Let's yeah. build some environment Basically, about working yeah. conditions. Yeah, basically, you know, yeah, the cities are going to be really, really important because this IPCC report also, we found that cities are going to be the worst impacted. We are not realizing, you know, we think that we are in cities, we will be saved, but cities are going to be the worst impacted in terms of okay. health. Yeah, I mean, I mean of, forget just from yeah. the labor perspective, which is very important. Exactly. Even productivity, yeah, it, I mean. Let's yeah, take it, from the capital perspective. GDP it, will go down, you know. Yeah, I did yeah, not report yeah. those. Actually, yeah. we have shown how, how much the GDP yeah. will go down yeah. for these four mega cities. So, and imagine so when, growth centers. 
actually. So when we speak about, you know, this democratizing the surplus and getting it back for a, its own people, I mean, one of the exercises that we did, I mean, I must share that, is in Ladakh, I mean, because I was instrumental into writing the vision document, at least giving them uh, some space where they could go during the lunchtime, take a shower when it's minus 25 degrees, you know, create those, uh, that and for the sanitation workers I'm talking. Actually, we ha we'll have to do something of the sort, you know, when we're- No, doing... we have to do, we not will, you know, we need now. Because yes, yes. The, the productivity will go yes. down, you know, yes. why exactly. people are, we say that people so are- Probably, lazy. Arjun, I think this is another area which we should venture now. You know, what kind of cities, are, are, you know, from completely a working perspective, you know, and what, what is it required? And probably we'll have it once again, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can so tell you one more to thing. To I'll just add one more thing, you know, we made an estimation. Suppose if you have a city with walking lanes with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, appropriately planted bushes and trees, yeah, yeah, yeah. the temperature under that goes down by five degrees. I, I, we have I, measurements. I have I have shared this anecdote <laughs> yesterday, ma'am, when when I was uh, making I mean when I was just um, I mean addressing uh, this uh, this webinar that I commute on my bicycle in Delhi, you know, from Sri Fort back to you know, where I stay at Ashoka Road, and I can just feel the difference, you know, where yeah. you have trees and where you do not have trees. Yeah, absolutely true. May I, I substantiate what you're saying? So thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Joshi. Uh, Sorry, Dr. So I hope I'm, yes, I'm pronouncing it right now. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, please, please go ahead and take it. Sure, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, words. So, uh, ma'am, now I will move on to uh, another set of questions. Uh, Amitita Ji is asking if air conditioner uh, is supposed to benefit us, uh, how, how will it uh, help in the global warming? Because uh, it is one of the major causes of global warming. Yeah. That's that's my bread and butter every day, you know. <laughs> so what I want to say is that basically there is going to be some increase in demand for energy for air conditioning, definitely. You cannot avoid that, but you can make it a choice how many hours you will be using whether you will be using the most efficient air conditioner, right? And how you can suppose this is a webinar, right? I can sit with my uh, standard clothing, which is not, uh, I mean, which doesn't need too much of air conditioning, right? But if we had this in a hotel, just tell me in the hotels how cold the rooms are, right? So we can one degree of, temperature increase in the air conditioner reduces one kilowatt hour of uh, electricity consumption. So now in many, um, in our many of the event meetings, we have made it a point that we will not keep the air conditioner below 25 degrees Celsius. We do not need it. That's bad for your health also. So we need air conditioner, but it doesn't mean that you need all the time and then you need a blanket and you uh, take an air conditioner, right? So we need to be making choices that how much of air conditioning we do need. But this is something, again, cure measure. Preventive measure is you can orient your house in such a way so that there is more wind flow and there will be less air conditioning need. Why do we need all closed, um, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, seminar space where we need all lights on during broad daylight? We never thought of this, but in India, we have an advantage. We are going to build more new cities every day, right? So we can make a better choice of not making them locked in on a high emission pathway. So that's why I'm saying there will be a need for some air conditioning. Without that, you cannot have 100% workability. So there needs to be a balance how much, and then you clean up your electricity and you take the best equipment so that you have less energy demand. And that's how you manage adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development. We are saying triple win is needed nowadays. 
uh, Kowalji is asking, what are the heat wave mitigative measures to be taken for exposed population, especially laborers and street vendors, et cetera? Yeah, so their working hour need to change. You know, their working hour need to change. You need to, you should not imagine that they will be forever there in your city. So how can you put them um, under shades? So can you give them shades? Can you give them a mobile van where they will having a shade? And through that, they will go. You will notice that many of the rickshaw pullers nowadays use a shade on top of them. And that's actually good, but they use plastic that increases the temperature. So can we not suggest better solution for them. This is our scientist approach we should be giving to them because we are the service taker from them. So we need to know what are the things we need to do, right? So informal sector health care and health insurance services needs to be there. But again, I'm saying that is a care measure, but we need to be thinking of the preventive measure. Ma'am, uh, Dr. Komal is asking, uh, being citizens, what can we do on our part to protect from heat waves and small efforts always bring good results. Okay, I always say that what you can have is that you can have a green roof. You know, you, you keep your roof with greenery, the temperature inside your room will be going down four to five degrees and you will not need your air conditioner all the time. And that's how you can do one, right? So this is your home. Also, another thing you can do, if you cannot put greenery, then you whitewash your uh, uh, roof that reflects the sun ray and that reduces the temperature in your home. And you can use your clothing types in such a way so that you are less uh, um, under stress. You keep your health related issues like dehydration and all those issues in such a better manner so that you can look for those. And also now after COVID, we have learned, and even for this program, we are learning that how, um, I mean, online digitization can solve many of our problems. So maybe work from home can be a solution during the summer months for Indian hot cities. You know, so there are several things that we need to be understanding and we need to be looking into what kind of dietary choice. We talk about nowadays the sustainable um, uh, dietary choice, which keeps your body cooler. And so we can go for those and so that you can manage your health much better. Well, thank you, uh, 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 Professor Roy, uh, for taking up all the questions. Even though we have some more questions on the Q&A uh, uh, section, right now we are running short of time. Sure. So uh, we will end this session. And I would like yes. to thank you once again, ma'am, for being with us and taking your time out uh, for uh, this excellent deliberation and sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you. You can send me the questions by email and I can send you the responses. Sure, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you. And ma'am, if you need to make any concluding comments, want to know? Um, no, what I really want to say is that uh, we should not be only talking about heat wave. My last word will be that we should be talking about multiple health stresses that will be created by the climate extremes. And we know these signs, we must talk about this, we must teach this in the schools and every day we need to have a talk show, maybe radio, maybe television, in the newspaper, these are the ways and city uh, mayors, as you said, needs to be involved. They need to have more financial power and decision-making power because uh, they are the ones who are implementing policies at the city level. With these words, thank you very much for this um, organizing this session. Thank you, ma'am, so much. Now, uh, moving on to our next and last session of our day two of this training program. Um, our next uh, eminent speaker is Mr. Anup Kumar Srivastava. Mr. Srivastava is the senior consultant at Drought and Heat Wave Policy and Planning Division, National Disaster Management Authority, NDMA, India. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. So please uh, take over the session. Floor is yours.
Yes, we can see. Sir. Uh, good morning. I am audible. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizer and earlier presenter uh, is a very well uh, presented in the uh, climate change and uh, heat health uh, aspect very well. Uh, one thing I added, uh, climate change and heat health aspect is a must be involved in the uh, government sector and people's participation is a required. Uh, without uh, uh, involving in this sector, uh, not achieve the our goal and uh, target of the uh, heat stress uh, come down. Okay, uh, I am start my presentation. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, my presentation is uh, uh, understanding uh, comprising on the context of and definition key variable of heat wave criteria for heat wave de uh, declaration in India, hazard risk and vulnerability affected area from heat wave in India and heat wave impact on lives, livelihood, environment, socioeconomic conditions, heat wave resilience, prevention, preparedness, mitigation measures and challenges and way forward. So my presentation is a no, uh, very, uh, Uh, now, contest. contest. India is the second most populous uh, country in the world with a considerably high population density. Is the ma major problem is uh, here. Due to climate change, rising average temperature, and India is also affected, increasing extreme weather events and increasing urban heat Iceland. Uh, like uh, in the uh, main uh, Delhi, Chandra Chowk is also very affected of the heat wave. And similarly, uh, other state is affected and develop the heat Iceland. Uh, extreme weather event uh, increasing, uh, the in, in, uh, intense heat wave become more frequent, severe, affecting health and livelihood of vulnerable population uh, due to climate change. And uh, also uh, last six, seven years, visible number of state, district, city, town, and rural areas in India have been severely affected. More than 19 crore people uh, resisting uh, 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 in a core heat wave zone in India, mostly vulnerable and weaker section. Heat wave caused uh, 25,696 days between 92 to 2021. Uh, this year figure is also uh, uh, not uh, uh, published uh, uh, due to uh, some state is still verified, uh, verifying the data and uh, uh, confirm the deaths and illness. Uh, now, uh, heat wave uh, definition, uh, heat wave can cause significant harm uh, to people, uh, human life, livestock and ecosystem. It does not have a universal acceptance of definition. Uh, country has uh, various countries define heat uh, uh, threshold according to the different climatic zone. Uh, like uh, uh, in India, you also define the uh, 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 various uh, uh, verifying the different state to state. Like uh, we in uh, next slide uh, you define in this uh, criteria. Uh, now. It is uh, certain countries uh, define the them uh, in terms of heat index based on the temperature and humidity or based on the extreme percentile, percentile base of the uh, uh, maximum, heat, uh, maximum temperature. Uh, now in general heat wave is defined a period abnorm uh, abnormally. One second. Sir. ये व्यू कैसे हम चेंज कर सकते हैं इसका व्यू कैसे चेंज कर सकते हैं ये 
व्यू कैसे चेंज कर सकते हैं ना नहीं ये तो हमारा इसमें आ रहा है लेकिन व्यू ये साइड में आ रहा है ना अच्छा इसको ये कर देते हैं पंजाब हरियाणा दिल्ली उत्तर प्रदेश बिहार झारखंड वेस्ट बंगाल उड़ीसा मध्य प्रदेश राजस्थान गुजरात एंड पार्ट ऑफ महाराष्ट्र कर्नाटका आंध्र प्रदेश तेलंगाना सम टाइम्स इज आकोर असम ओवर तमिलनाडु एंड केरला इज आल्सो अफेक्टेड द हीट वेव सम अदर स्टेट आकोर इन द हीट वेव लाइक गोवा हिमाचल प्रदेश जम्मू कश्मीर उत्तराखंड छत्तीसगढ़ एंड अरुणाचल प्रदेश नाउ मैप शोइंग द हीट वेव जोन एंड हीट वेव अफेक्टेड स्टेट इन द राइट राइट कॉर्नर in summer season this year in summer season uh, uh, 2022 march to june based on the period 1981 uh, to 2010 now average temperature recorded is a very high in the last uh, 122 years uh, 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 average maximum temperature recorded ever highest with the 33.1 degree uh, centigrade in last 122 years for the period of uh, 1901 to 2020 and similarly in april month highest recorded average maximum temperature over northwest india has been 35.9 degree centigrade in last 72 years uh, and uh, see the 1.4 degree centigrade maximum temperature is uh, increase in this uh, year recorded and minimum minimum temp- temperature is also highest uh, uh, 1.08 uh, so uh, here uh, not a minimum temperature increase uh, not a maximum temperature increase also is a minimum temperature is increase because uh, many health uh, uh, expert is here so health expert also define now minimum temperature is also affect uh, to the uh, people uh, for heat stress and heat exposure uh now heat wave uh, affect uh, mostly vegetable vendor cab driver auto repair mechanic construction worker traffic police we are uh, not included in the traffic police is uh, every day and in the um, uh, um, uh, during the mid uh, of the day and standing in, for the traffic uh, uh, control mostly uh, are the weaker section of the society uh heat wave deaths now 25696 people died due to heat wave between 92 to 2021 and uh, we have comparison uh, 2011 to 15 6973 deaths is uh, recorded and 2016 to 21 1743 uh, deaths are uh, recorded in addition heat wave caused deaths of animal wildlife birds and cattle is extra very effective so this uh, figure 2016 to 20 uh, 2021 due uh, less than uh, 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 previous year recorded the heat wave deal due to some uh, action taken by uh, india and uh, government agency and uh, various stakeholder state government and uh, research organization uh, like iiph gandhi nagar nrdc uh, imd ministry of health and environment uh, environment ministry of health and former welfare various uh, main streaming uh, government agency is also involved to take an action uh, for the heat wave uh, prevention preparedness and mitigation measures now impact of heat wave uh, now uh, commonly uh, earlier presenter presenter has discussed the impact of the heat uh, health uh, aspect 
now impact is a very large very large now uh, not a health uh, health impact uh, but water uh, sector is also affected availability and supply of quality of uh, water resulted water more disease is a high higher level sanitation and hygiene is also uh, very affected uh, now agriculture and food security is also uh, uh, very impacted Uh, this year now one research is a come uh, come up and high a higher temperature uh, recorded due to march february march and april has been affected on agriculture production and food and nutrition supply uh, basically on uh, uh, basically on the wheat production and other crops also is affected but uh, uh, due course of the research and uh, similarly livestock decrease in milk production and livelihood uh, in the village area labor and employment uh, also uh, is affected reduce reduce the work efficiency and capacity uh, development work and productivity is also reduce uh, similarly education uh, system is also affected due to uh, heat wave now learning activities due to heat uh, exposure uh child is not going to coaching institute and uh, uh schools and uh, uh, so uh, impact on heat wave on the education learning system and similarly power power sector is also affected increasing demand of the power due to heat wave uh, so many uh, families of uh, uh, um, in urban area so ask uh, 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 continuous uh, 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 work uh, uh, fan and ac is using and heat wave impacted much more on economic activities so compile this uh, uh, affected uh, sector and uh, much more uh, sector is involved who uh, affected and impacted so uh, then Uh, calculate the impacted much more the economic activities and uh, country losses secondary increase uh, now challenges uh, this is the uh, reality now challenges is the increasing frequency intensity and duration of heat wave can lead the dangerous of health and cause uh, causes death who is a, uh, also a statements increasing trend of heat wave in india now nine state is affected in 2015 and 23 state uh, is a, uh, vulnerable in 2021 and people are much affected increasing vulnerability mostly weaker section of the society large number of mortality due to heat wave lack of institutional mechanism to heat wave management and lack of civil political awareness on the heat wave heat wave is not uh, uh, one is a another very big challenge heat wave is not notified disaster at national level so that not eligible to uh, use of ndrf or sdrf fund to uh, prevention preparedness and mitigation measures and response uh, uh, relief and response so uh, also another problem is a lack of accurate information and data related to heat wave uh, basically heat related illness and death uh, are uh, avoidable the impact of extreme heat wave on human health livestock li uh, livelihood agriculture and lastly is the economy uh, now uh, heat wave uh, what is the heat wave management uh, uh, system in india and what is the uh, policy and plan so country uh, india is uh, uh, change the country policy to relief centric to prevention and preparedness centric and enacted the disaster management act to 2005 as per uh, uh, under section 2d of dm act so uh, catastrophe or mishap calamity of uh, grave occurrence in any area arising from natural and man made cause as to be beyond the coping capacity of the affected area so ndma used this uh, uh, 
क्योंकि बेसिकली एनडीएमए इज एपेक्स बॉडी ऑफ द डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट सो यूज दिस डिफिनेशन एंड ट्राई टू डेवलप ए इंस्टीट्यूशनल मैकेनिज्म सो पीपुल्स आर और एंड स्टेट गवर्नमेंट एंड अदर डिस्ट्रिक्ट लेवल गवर्नमेंट एंड एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन कैन बी यूज this institutional uh, uh, system and uh, avoid the heat wave uh, affected uh, uh, person illness and death reducing the heat wave illness and death ndma made it to lay down the policy plan and guidelines and follow the ministry department state to prevent the disaster as per dmf as per section 38 of dmf uh, every uh, A state ministry and uh, department uh, uh, to accordance with the guidelines laid down by uh, preparation and action plan for uh, for laid down by the policy uh, 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 guidelines laid down by the NDMA. So that NDMA decide to prepare the guidelines for preparation of heat action plan and develop an institutional mechanism to heat wave management in India. so prevention preparedness and mitigation measures we have uh, ndma prepare a heat wave uh, guidelines in 2016 and they are after revising the 2017 and 2019 and 19 in the base of uh, uh, field experiences and uh, uh, various state government uh, experiences um, uh, ndma uh, Uh, adopted a key strategy for strengthening the early warning system and communication system mobilizing inter agency coordination like imd ministry of health and other ministry and state government uh, preparedness and mitigation measures uh, public awareness and community outreach capacity building of professionals and stakeholders preparedness, uh, preparedness at local level and collaboration with the private non government and civil society reducing heat exposure and promoting adaptive measures of the climate change and uh, uh, other adaptation plan assessing the impact feedback for reviewing the and updating the plan so i earlier mentioned the heat uh, heat wave guidelines based on the uh, uh, ndma uh, organizing the annual national workshop and Uh, uh come up with the uh, recommendations we have uh, uh, uh revised in the our uh, heat wave guidelines and based on the this guidelines state government and district uh, uh, level or city level uh, prepared the heat action plan uh now and ndma only uh, uh, now activities Uh, major activity ndma issue the national le uh, level uh, national guidelines for preparation of action plan prevention and management heat wave ndma organize annual national workshop on heat wave in collaboration with the affected state aim to sensitize state towards the need of preparing and implementing the heat action plan ndma also pre uh, preliminary study to estimate estimation of temperature threshold in 103 cities in india and also hazard analysis of heat wave including wind speed wind direction temperature and consecutive heat wave days to issuing impact based forecast warning by imd because imd uh, provided the forecast uh, uh, four times and five, uh, in a, like uh, now cast uh, uh, extended range of forecast and daily forecast but only forecast and alert and warning not a based huge of general people people want to uh, uh, this is the temperature and high temperature what can i uh, uh, accent uh, to be taken so we will uh, include uh, the impact this temperature means impact on the uh, people at ground level so what is a action to be taken by people to uh, 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 less affected due to heat wave
also issue an advisory do and don'ts and share with the all heat prone state reviewing uh, heat wave preparedness through video conference with all state in time to time issue a manual of house owner guidelines alternate roof cooling solution uh for long term uh, uh heat wave uh, prevention uh, and mit um, mitigation measures heat wave is a, a special episode aapda ka samna on heat wave was telecast uh, in uh, april 2020 in the latest and uh, link is also is there and a special news later edition of heat wave was published online and the image also focusing on community sensitization and awareness generation on regular basis through all forms of social media platform uh ndma uh, basically uh, a flow chart is the what is the uh, our system and what is the heat wave management uh, in india so national disaster management authority taking the mitigation measures and coordination uh with a different depart department and ministry and imd on and iitm provide the early warning and forecast and this forecast using the uh, uh ndma and provided the further actionable points to a state and guided to a state and district uh, uh, level what is the start preparatory uh, action and duration of heat, uh, during the heat wave and evaluation and the future plans in uh, end of seasons and right hand process follow up the heat prone states state uh, government state disaster management authority uh, policy and action plan issue instruction preparedness and review the and appointment and nodal officer and a state nodal officer coordinated with the all district disaster management authority and district collector and block and panchayat and village level uh, ensure the effective uh, implementation of this action plan and uh, advisory and do and don'ts now imd issue a long range uh, forecast is at, at a whole season extended range of forecast 2 to 4 week Uh, medium range uh, forecast four to ten days, short range forecasts one to three days, uh, and now past three to six hour. Local for forecast is a district and sub district level. At uh, uh, regional forecast uh, uh, offices at a state level uh, provided. So uh, these types of uh, color coding forecast. Uh, in uh, imd provided green uh, like green x green color coding basically 36 below the 36 degree temperature okay and uh, no action comfortable temperature no caution cautionary action required uh, three uh, yellow alert orange alert and red alert also provide and yellow alert is a heat condition at district level likely to be persist for two days if two days temperature is a 37 to 40 degree and also correlate with a heat index 32 to uh, uh, 41 degree centigrade is a yellow uh, alert so people know uh, alert alertness and come what is the action is required uh so next is a uh, important very important issue the early warning dissemination dissemination through local print uh, and electronic media issue of daily warning using email fax mobile sms whatsapp etc etc display board of color coding for heat wave alertness in different cities uh, uh, like uh, mumbai uh, uh, hyderabad uh vijayawada various various place noida uh, various place uh, uh, is uh, 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 display board is just a setting of and radio jingla and tv scroll on the local channels display hoarding advertisement warning messages uh, to officers at a state level and district level collectors and advisory for tourists 
also we will provide uh, now uh, preparedness measures like uh, setting of the state district control rooms uh, prepare and implementation of heat action plans and sop uh, stock uh, stock peeling of overall uh, oral mm -hmm. rehydration solutions preparing drinking water and hand pumps renovation of the deepening of water bodies under the manrega uh, manrega capacity building of health personnel now mitigation measures early start and early closure of school colleges institutions departments uh, uh, earlier presenter presenter is also mentioned that points now drinking water kiosk and stall identified at the different place of the city and uh, rural areas also uh, and provide uh, drinking water supply water through tankers where is a uh, uh, where a shortfall of the drinking water so state government and district uh, officials is a uh, pre plan for the supply uh, uh, identified the vulnerable place where is a need for water supply during the heat wave so uh, uh, affected area supply of water through tankers setting up a special center for wage employment workers and rescheduling their working hours in um, uh, advisory issue by ministry of labor and in, uh, employment construction of animal shelter with fodder bank in different state uh, uh, apply this uh, 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 using construction of animal uh, shelter and folder bank folder bank tree positioning and uh, of adequate veterinary medicine and supply to reduce the impact of uh, livestock also we have public awareness we have prepared the public ad in uh, different language english hindi and other language uh, in uh, heat prone affected state uh, based on the iid forecast and warning and also ndm have prepared a 20 uh, 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 tvc short commercial uh, uh, film so people can be uh, local government use this film in different uh, meeting seminar and uh, gram sabha and uh, everywhere so people aware of this uh, heat wave uh, 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 problems and uh, solutions now uh, now awareness generation we have using the uh, uh, dissemination of do and don'ts and ic material in local language information dictionary in local newspaper radio jingala tvc and radio, uh, in regional language and social media for outreach mass uh, uh, mailing tax tax messages in different state uh, see the gujarat uh, uh, maharashtra tamil tamil language uriya in different uh, local language now social campaign using the social campaign for heat wave alertness and what warning and do and don'ts on facebook twitter linkedin and commercial uh, tvc commercial print and electronic media in different mode we have last year using the uh, during the heat wave period and uh, covid 19 both are uh, vulnerable so a specific advisory to central ministry department state government district administration and municipal corporation do and don'ts on heat wave during the covid 19 uh, and public awareness campaign coordinated with the state for preparation of heat action plan uh, during the covid 19 so in the long uh, term adopting cool roof as a long term measures like lime based uh, white pass white ceramic tiles covering which can reduce the temperature 3 to 7 degree for indoor uh, area 
uh, and operational uh, forecast for maximum temperature in short, medium, and extended range of time. So people can be aware. So uh, and plan to any uh, outdoor work. Uh, before the uh, five days or three days or four days. If a warning is a uh, red alert for next five days, so people can be stopped the, our plan and extended the, upon our uh, uh, personal work. So integrate clim climate variability mitigation and ad adaptation effort in heat action plan, improving fo uh, forest coverage and green areas, uh, Implemented by Ministry of uh, Ministry of Forest and uh, uh, Environment, Forest and uh, Climate Change, health harming air pollution, a, a, a study and health impact assessment of ambient house uh, household uh, air pollution, also uh, more important. Adopting cool loop technique as a long term measures. Uh, see the right uh, picture in various cities like Ahmedabad, Indore, Hyderabad, and some other cities also uh, uh, adopting this plan. Uh, and this is the very effective uh, plan uh, at mitigation measures, long term mitigation measures, and cool down the houses. Uh, so Intense and sub, uh, substance effort by increasing heat wave and reducing heat wave impact. So uh, national uh, level and state level and district level, basically heat action plan is implemented at the ground level and uh, district level, uh, district collector is also uh, monitor in during the heat wave at block level and village level. So and other academic institutions is involved. Uh, health uh, 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 ministry is also involved. And other uh, research organization like IIPH, uh, Gandhi Nagar IIPH, Bhuneswar, and uh, NRDC is also civil society organization is involved to take an action uh, for heat wave. And uh, look at the vulnerable state and district. 2005, nine state is a vulnerable and uh, uh, increasing to 2020 and 2021 is the 23 state. And district is also uh, increasing year by year. And heat affected people is also recorded higher, uh, higher in 2017. But number of death due to heat wave recorded is going down because a lot of uh, pre prevention, preparedness, and uh, mitigation measures uh, uh, is uh, taken at the ground level. Uh, this slide is uh, clearly so where is the uh, our heat wave mortality in 2015, and this graph is uh, 2020 is uh, going. Uh, below and he, uh, green color is uh, showing the heat wave affected state and red color is uh, uh, showing the average uh, heat wave number of heat wave days uh, is uh, also increasing in the uh, country now we have lesson learned what kinds of uh, uh, action to be taken to uh, reducing the heat wave impact? Now, strengthening of early warning system, need for understanding local threshold, heat action plan and institutional mechanism, dissemination to the community, monitoring through different layer, like national level NDMA is a monitor, a state level is State government or uh, SDMA also monitor, and district level is a SDMA, uh, DDMA or district collector is a monitor. And similarly, in the block level, BDOs and uh, Tasildar is a uh, SDM is also uh, monitor uh, through nodal officer and data collection and analysis is well. Uh, way forward and 
heat wave resilience review the heat wave preparedness and implementation heat action plan heat wave a heat action plan should become a standard response at the city and district level main streaming of the heat wave management like uh, uh, different uh, uh, department different uh, uh, ministry is uh, involved in the regular annual plan like jal uh, shakti ministry is a plan our, uh, our uh, Uh, heat wave resilience uh, uh, activities along with the budget so a, a additional budget is not required so uh, ma main is streaming of the heat wave management is a very important focus on mitigation measures to risk reduction uh, linkage with the climate change ad and adaptation action capacity building and local level awareness campaign is a very important and public health measure for protection against the heat wave need to be stepped up integration of development plans with the long term mitigation measures uh, various ministry and department uh, uh, running the developmental plans uh, uh, and uh, uh, can be included the mitigation measures on the heat wave related issues now long term measures say also is a cool loop vegetation greenery and water conservation need to be part of adaptation plan research and development to strengthen the heat wave management in india like last year research given the on the agriculture sector we also uh, required to live stock uh, sector is also need to uh, research and other sector like uh, uh, labor and employment sector where losses where is the impacted uh, so further action to be taken now cool loop is a simple and cost effective solution to urbanization challenges a roof that stay cool in the uh, sun by reflecting sunlight to minimize solar absorption and emitting thermal radiation to help uh, dissipate solar heat again like picture so is the reflection 20% is reflected and reflected 80% so dark cool loop and white cool loop very so benefit of, of the provided thermal comforter reducing indoor temperature protect vulnerable people improve comfort comfort for uh, harness schools hospitals and other uh, building enhance the productivity and extended roof life of the reduce the maintenance if you uh, using the um, extended uh, cool roof technology so our house uh, is also uh, life is uh, increase in air conditioner building improve comfort reduce cool, uh, cooler demand money and enhance the saving and implemented on a large scale work to reduce urban heat island and this is the last slide do and don'ts now reducing the uh, minimize the impact of heat wave due to using the do and don'ts is a very simple thing if this uh, do and don'ts uh, we will be huge you using the uh, public so mostly uh, i think he uh, heat wave uh, risk is a minimized very minimized like like avoid going the out in the sun especially between 12 to 3 pm and drink sufficient water and as often the possible even if not thirsty wear light uh, weight light color loose and porous cotton cloth use protective glass umbrella hat shoes and chappal with going outside in the sun avoid strenuous activities when the outside temperature is high avoid working outside between 12 to 3 pm like uh, various state is uh, working uh, in the manrega 
and mondega worker is a, uh, working in this uh, uh, mid uh, uh, day so advice to to a state and ministry of uh, uh, rural development to this uh, timing is, uh, has been changed people are working in the narega 6 to uh, 10 pm uh, 10 am or 7 to 11 am and then uh, break the uh, uh, middle day and also again work in the 4 pm to 6 pm uh, in the evening while traveling carry water with you avoid alcohol tea coffee and carbonated soft drink which dehydrate by body on a high level protein food and do not eat uh, stale food if you work outside use hat or umbrella and also use the damp clothes or your heat uh neck face and limbs do not leave children on pets and park vehicle if you feel faint or ill see a doctor immediately uh use ors homemade drink like lassi torni rice water lemon water buttermilk etc which help to rehydrate of the body keep animal in shade and given them penalty of water drinks keep your home cool use certain shutters or sunset and open window at night because uh, <clears throat> minimum temperature is also uh, affected to reduce the uh, uh heat wave uh, uh body is a uh, uh and body tayar ho jata hai next day ke heat wave ko uh, lene ke liye use fan damp clothing and take bath in cool uh, cold water frequently agar do se teen bar agar din mein uh, nahane ka mauka mil jata hai water sufficient hai to aap usse body cool ho jata hai thank you thank you shri anup kumar ji for your presentation and giving us an overview of uh, ndms activities and action plans uh, related to heat waves um tikender sir ji uh, would you like to add some comments to the presentation <gasps> no i think uh, uh... Or we, it's better if we just uh, get onto the questions because we are already running short of time. Yes. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a very interesting presentation that has been made. So let's take the questions. All right, sir. So uh, I will read out some questions for you, sir, uh, Anup yeah. Sirji. Yeah. First question is by Nihal Ji, and the question is: How has NDMS policy approach to heat waves changed since? Uh, the heat wave has been recognized as a disaster by ndma in 2015 okay <clears throat> you can see my slide yes sir ah uh, dekhiye main hindi mein jawab dena chahunga जी आ, वेव, आ, ये नेशनल जो डिजास्टर 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 नोटिफाइड है है जिसमें हीट वेव शामिल नहीं है। जिसका आ, मतलब ये होता है कि उसका एनडीआरएफ और एसडीआरएफ जो नॉर्म्स है उस नॉर्म्स के तहत उसको फंड का यूज नहीं कर सकते और जब फंड का यूज नहीं कर सकते तो देन स्टेट और डिस्ट्रिक्ट लेवल ऑफिशियल या कोई स्टेट बहुत ज्यादा इंटरेस्ट नहीं लेते भले ही डेथ हो रहा है या अगर पॉलिसी कोई नहीं है तो अगर स्टेट मदद भी किसी को करना चाहता तो वो नहीं कर पाता है ऐसे में एनडीए में ने चूंकि एपेक्स बॉडी है डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट का तो इसको को रिलेट किया सेक्शन टू डी से जिसमें ये कहा गया है उसके डिफिनेशन में दिया है कि कैटेस्ट्रॉफ मिसैप कैलेमिटी और ग्रेव ऑकुरेंस इन 
any area arising from the natural or man-made cause to be beyond the coping capacity of affected area. So, the heat wave, maximum temperature or heat wave आता है तो उसमें आदमी का कोई भी rural area या सारी area का कोई अपना हाथ नहीं होता है. तो ऐसे में coping beyond the coping capacity है तो उसको कैसे हम लोग मदद कर सकते हैं? NDMA already in the past NDMA is uh, apex body so has the power uh, to lay down the policy and plan and guidelines followed by ministry and de uh, department state to prevent the disaster. Under section 6 may ye power diya hua. So NDMA ne ye decide kiya ki hum ek guidelines banate hain kyunki abhi kisi bhi state mein guidelines nahi hai except Ahmedabad heat action plan bana ek city ka plan hai lekin kisi bhi state mein heat action plan nahi hai fir usko follow karke jaise Ahmedabad city action plan bana usi tarah ke district level pe aur different cities ka action plan hona chahiye in the pure country mein jahan bhi heat affected area hai so thanks ki एक अहमदाबाद ही सिटी एक्शन प्लान जो बनाया उसको बेस पे एक गाइडलाइंस जो एनडीएमए ने परसो किया तो इंस्टीट्यूशनल एक कैपेसिटी एक डेवलप होना स्टार्ट हो गया पूरे कंट्री में जो भी हीट अफेक्टेड स्टेट पे और उसको फॉलो कर रहे हैं और देन फिर हीट वेव एक्स गाइडलाइंस के बेस पे more than uh, jo heat affected state hai usme se more than 90% heat action plan state ne bana liya hai aur iske alawa jahan bhi major cities affected on heat wave wahan bhi heat action plan banaya hai aur usko sirf plan banane ka koi matlab nahi hota hai lekin agar usko sop mein dal karke aur action uh, points niche agar jata hai ground level pe grassroots level pe aur us pe action hota hai wo feasible hai usi action ka parinam hai ki heat wave ka deaths ko reduce karne mein madad mile thank you sir uh, there is one question uh, sailender ji wants to ask you sailender ji please unmute yourself and ask your question to sir Shailendra ji. Pravin ji, are you there? You can ask the question, please, sir. Shailendra ji. So we read it out. Okay. Uh, no, uh, he requested to ask uh, for the question. So, um, all right. Uh, so I will uh, just read out another question for you. Uh, why, why is there more number of deaths in coastal regions? Yeah. So my one slide is missing. Uh, uh, the earlier uh, presenter uh, मैंने पहले के जो hmm. present किया है उसमें ये बताया होगा क्योंकि heat wave का country में भारत में consideration करने का जो define define किया हुआ है based on the temperature higher temperature लेकिन higher temperature में जैसे uh, हम देखेंगे coastal area के लिए जो temperature है वो uh, Forty seven degree and more of the coastal station के लिए coastal area में ये सिर्फ temperature का आ, के साथ साथ humidity बड़े पैमाने पर होती है तो जो feel like temperature है वो increase कर जाता है example के तौर पे अगर राजस्थान में 47, 48, 49 degree temperature in general condition में रहता है 
लेकिन वहां ह्यूमिडिटी बहुत कम रहती है तो पब्लिक जो फील करता है टेम्परेचर वो आपको 52, 53 रहता है लेकिन अगर कोस्टल एरिया में 39 डिग्री टेम्परेचर हो गया और वहां पे जो ह्यूमिडिटी 80 परसेंट सेवेंटी परसेंट चला गया तो ऐसे में वो टेम्परेचर जो पब्लिक फील करती है वो मोर देन 54, 55, 56 ऐसे फील करती है ऐसे में जो उनका जो बॉडी से इवोपरेशन होता है आ, वो जो पसीना निकलता है वो पसीना बाहर नहीं आ पाता है वो चिपचिपा सा शरीर में चिपका रहता है वो चिपके रहने से जो हीट जो बाहर आना चाहिए वो बाहर नहीं आने के कारण अंदर अंदर वो मेडिकल फील्ड में ज्यादा एक्सक्लूसिव तरीके से बता पाएंगे कि अंदर अंदर जो ब्लड सर्कुलेशन है वो सर्कुलेशन अफेक्ट करता है और फाइनली वो डेथ के कगार पे चले जाते हैं तो हीट स्ट्रेस हीट हीट स्टॉक होने की संभावना वहां पे ज्यादा बन जाती है सर अनादर क्वेश्चन इस पर जागृति जी वो पूछ रहे हैं कि अगर एनडीए में हैज डेवलप्ड हीट इंडेक्स देखिए एनडीए में हीट इंडेक्स एनडीए में कोऑर्डिनेट कर सकता है और इसके ऊपर जो है काफी लोग काम कर रहे हैं जैसे आईआईटी दिल्ली पिछले तीन साल से इस पे काम कर रहे हैं आईएमडी से इंफॉर्मेशन डाटा वो शेयर कर रहे हैं उसी तरह से एक चेन्नई का जो रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट है वो भी काम कर रहे हैं बहुत सारे रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट काम कर रहे हैं एनडीएमए इज नॉट रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट एनडीएमए इज एपेक्स बॉडी ऑफ डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट तो डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट को कैसे हम पॉलिसी में डाल सकते हैं अगर कोई रिसर्च आता है हीट uh, इंडेक्स को लेकर के तो हम उसको अडॉप्ट करके और उसके ऊपर हम लोग स्टेट के साथ में या लोकल uh, गवर्नमेंट के साथ में उसको अप्लाई uh, कर सकते हैं उसको सर कोमल जी uh, पूछ रहे हैं कि uh, हम लोगों uh, स्टूडेंट्स को कैसे हीट वेब्स के बारे में अवेयर कर सकते हैं कौन सा है स्टूडेंट लाइक like, uh, जैसे स्टूडेंट्स और लोगों को कैसे अवेयरनेस फैला सकते हैं हीट yeah. वेव्स के बारे में या या हीट वेव अवेयरनेस हम लोगों ने प्रोग्राम जैसे चलाते हैं एक तो सोशल मीडिया का यूज कर सकते हैं और इसके अलावा जो कैपेसिटी बिल्ड करते हैं वो एनआईडीएम भी ऑर्गेनाइज करता है ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम उसमें गवर्नमेंट ऑफिसर्स उनको करते हैं इसके अलावा एन में एन जो है मास्टर ट्रेनर भी बना तैयार करता है जो कि इंस्टीट्यूशन में जाते हैं कई सारे प्राइवेट स्कूल से लेकर के गवर्नमेंट स्कूल में भी जाते हैं तो वो कैपेसिटी बिल्ड करते हैं इसके अलावा मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हेल्थ वो कैपेसिटी बिल्ड करता है मेडिकल स्टूडेंट्स को डॉक्टर को और आ, जो हेल्थ पर्सनल है उनको इसके अलावा जो लोकल लेवल पे स्टेट गवर्नमेंट है स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ऑलरेडी कैपेसिटी बिल्ड करता है जैसे बिहार है आंध्र प्रदेश है महाराष्ट्र है राजस्थान है वो डिफरेंट स्कूल्स में कॉलेज में वो लेक्चर भी देने जाते हैं एज ए गेस्ट लेक्चर और उनकी कैपेसिटी बिल्ड भी करते हैं और तीसरी चीज है कि वो डिमांड बेस्ड अगर किसी इंस्टीट्यूशन से कहीं डिमांड आता है कि हमारे स्टूडेंट्स को आप थोड़ा कैपेसिटी बिल्ड कीजिए ऑन डिफरेंट डिजास्टर तो हमारे यहाँ से रिसोर्स पर्सन ऑलरेडी प्रोवाइड करते हैं कि जा करके वहां पे लेक्चर दे सके नॉट ए ओनली हीट वेव इन डिफरेंट डिजास्टर देखिए जैसा कि क्लाइमेट uh, चेंज का असर आ रहा है हमारे पहले जो एक्सपर्ट uh, ने बताया उसको इंटरनेशनली और नेशनली उसको लिंक किया कि क्लाइमेट चेंज का जो इफेक्ट है वो नॉट ए पूरा ग्लोबल में हो रहा है और अभी आईपीसीसी का जो रिपोर्ट आया है फरवरी 2022 में उसमें भी क्लियरली शो कर रहे हैं कि एशिया पैसिफिक और साउथ एशिया पैसिफिक स्पेशली हीट वेव और ऑफोरेंस यहाँ पे इंक्रीज कर रहा है और करेगा इन फ्यूचर में तो अभी से अगर क्लाइमेट चेंज बेस्ड हम एडोप्टेशन प्लान को यूज करें उसमें हम शामिल करें मिटिगेशन मेजर्स को कैसे हम 
डाल सकते हैं एज ए लॉन्ग टर्म प्रस्पेक्टिव में तो उसको रिड्यूस कर सकते हैं और कारण सबको पता है कि जिस तरह से हीट वेव का इंक्रीज इन, इंक्रीज सिर्फ इंडिया के प्रस्पेक्टिव में नहीं हो रहा है वो पूरा ग्लोबल प्रस्पेक्टिव में हो रहा है शैलेंद्र जी इज आस्किंग दंस्ट्रक्शन टेक्नोलॉजी इज रेस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द टेम्परेचर राइज एंड हाउ मच न्यू कंस्ट्रक्शन टेक्नोलॉजी कैन हेल्प वेन दे आर नॉट मच एक्सेप्टेड बाई कॉमन पर्सन एंड ड्यू टू हाई कॉस्ट एंड नेगलेक्टिंग द बेनिफिट इन लॉन्ग रन मतलब हाउ कंस्ट्रक्शन टेक्नोलॉजी इज रेस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर इंक्रीज इन टेम्परेचर इन इंडिया ऑफकोर्स जो कंस्ट्रक्शन हो रहा है आप देखें कि जिस तरह से कंट्री का पॉपुलेशन इंक्रीज कर रहा है जिस तरह से हम ग्रामीण क्षेत्र को छोड़ करके माइग्रेट कर रहे हैं शहरी क्षेत्र में और शहरी क्षेत्र में हाउसिंग हम जिस तरह से कंस्ट्रक्ट कर रहे हैं और हम एक तरह से कह सकते हैं कंक्रीट जंगल हम खड़ा कर रहे हैं वो कंक्रीट जंगल जो है सनलाइट को रिफ्लेक्ट करके और आ, वो रिफ्लेक्ट नहीं करता ऊपर तो सनलाइट का जो आ, हीट है वो एब्जॉर्ब करता है तो उससे एक गर्म गर्मी पैदा होती है रही बात हम शहरी इलाक देखें तो कहीं भी एरिया ऐसा स्पेसिफिक हम नहीं छोड़ रहे हैं कि जो सॉइल बेस हो जो सॉइल एब्जॉर्ब कर सके ही, हीट को तो कंस्ट्रक्शन अगर हम करेंगे तो उसमें वो वो, आ, वो हीट को बढ़ाएगा ही तीसरी चीज है कि जैसे हम लोगों ने अभी बताया कि कूल लुक टेक्नोलॉजी को अगर एडोप्ट करते हैं या ग्रीन बिल्डिंग को हम एडॉप्ट करते हैं तो उससे कूल रह सकते हैं अदरवाइज ये टेम्परेचर कंटिन्यूस इंक्रीज कर रहा है और करेगा तो वो अफेक्ट करेगा कंस्ट्रक्शन वर्कर कंस्ट्रक्शन जो सीमेंट बेस और लाइम बेस हम कंस्ट्रक्शन जो कर रहे हैं उसके कारण इंक्रीज कर रहा है तो हमें क्लाइमेट चेंज के प्रस्पेक्टिव में या ग्रीन बिल्डिंग या शहरी इलाके में हम ग्रीन ग्रीनरीज को बढ़ाएं जैसे रोड एरिया है तो रोड एरिया में जो दो जो डिवाइडर है डिवाइडर पे अगर हम प्लांटेशन करें तो वो थोड़ा कूल करेगा अदरवाइज हम उसको भी अडॉप्ट नहीं कर रहे हैं कई जगह डिवाइडर सिर्फ सिंपल आपने कंक्रीट का बना दिया तो उसमें एडोप्टेशन कहाँ होगा उसमें ग्रीनरीज तो है ही नहीं और दोनों तरफ हमने कहीं सॉइल छोड़ा नहीं कहीं प्लांटेशन नहीं है वो एब्जॉर्ब एब्जॉर्ब है हीट का वो एब्जॉर्ब करके उसको कूल नहीं कर पाएगा शाहिन जी इज आस्किंग व्हाट आर द मेजर सोशियो इकोनॉमिक एंड इकोलॉजिकल चैलेंजेस कॉज बाय हीट वेव्स इन इंडिया मेजर चैलेंजेस है कि इकोसिस्टम को हमें अगर मैनेज uh, करना है तो हमें क्लाइमेट चेंज एडोप्टेशन जो प्लान है उसको हमें ग्राउंड लेवल से ले करके चाहे ग्रामीण क्षेत्र से ले करके और शहरी क्षेत्र तक हमें इसको एडॉप्ट करना ही होगा अगर इसको नहीं करते हैं तो इसका कोई दूसरा उपाय नहीं हो सकता है और तीस दूसरी चीज है कि गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशन इसको नीचे तक ले जाने का प्रयास कर रहे हैं लेकिन ईमानदारी से इसका अगर इम्प्लीमेंटेशन होता है तो अभी इसका आ, 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 प्रतिफल मिलेगा अदरवाइज अगर इम्प्लीमेंटेशन अगर ग्राउंड लेवल पे नहीं होगा तो उसका कोई भी लाभ नहीं मिलेगा तो इसमें पीपल्स का पार्टिसिपेशन भी बहुत ही जरूरी है वो अगर हर गांव में ग्राम पंचायत और या ग्राम सभा में इस चीज को अगर डिस्कस करते हैं कि हमारे गांव का हमारे ब्लॉक का अगर टेम्परेचर इंक्रीज कर रहा है कैसे इसको आ, कम करना है आ, तो ग्रीनरीज को बढ़ाना है तो कैसे हम बढ़ाएं क्या क्या एक्टिविटीज है उसको हमें एडॉप्ट करना होगा तो देन फिर इकोसिस्टम को हम डेवलप कर सकते हैं शहरी इलाके में ज्यादा से ज्यादा ग्रीनरीज को बढ़ाना होगा नॉट ए सिर्फ हम सीमेंट का जो बिल्डिंग खड़ा करते जा रहे हैं उसके साथ साथ कूल लूप टेक्नोलॉजी और प्लस जो ग्रीनरी बिल्डिंग है उसको हमें एडोप्ट करना होगा Sir Anupriya ji is asking, how do we manage groundwater level while handling the heat waves? Ah, uh, groundwater level. So, do you see the heat wave? So, linkages so high. In this, as I have told you, 
शहरी इलाके में तो हमने कोई एरिया ऐसा छोड़ा नहीं जहां भी जगह बचता है रोड रोड से के बाद से घर का जो ए, ए, में घुसने के लिए जो हमने आ, एरिया बनाया वो सब सीमेंट कर दिया कहीं भी एरिया हमने छोड़ा नहीं जो ग्राउंड पे मिट्टी पे रेनफॉल आए और वो एब्जॉर्ब करे लेकिन शहरी इलाके में जो ड्रिंकिंग वाटर एक बहुत बड़ा चैलेंजेज है इन डिफरेंट रिवर से हम पानी को ले ले आ करके यहाँ सप्लाई करते हैं लेकिन यहाँ पे शहरी इलाकों में विदाउट परमिशन ग्राउंड वाटर को आ, निकालने की प्रक्रिया पूरे कंट्री में जारी है तो वो ग्राउंड वाटर को तो अफेक्ट करता है और रूरल एरिया में फिर भी लैंड है वहाँ पे एब्जॉर्बेशन होता है और उसको हमें एब्जॉर्ब करते हैं तो शहरी इलाके में भी हमें उस तरह का ग्राउंड वाटर रिचार्ज के लिए रेन वाटर हार्वेस्टिंग स्ट्रक्चर को प्रमोट करना होगा साथ में जो हमारा जो कंस्ट्रक्शन है कंस्ट्रक्शन के साथ साथ हमें ऐसे एरिया पॉकेट बनाने होंगे जो ग्राउंड वाटर को रिचार्ज करें छोटे छोटे तालाब छोटे छोटे जो जिस जिस तरह से हम कॉलोनियों में पार्क्स बनाते हैं उसी तरह से छोटे छोटे तालाब को भी हमें प्रमोट करना होगा ग्रामीण इलाके में तो तालाब और बाबरी ये सब होते हैं और उसको रिजुनेट करना पड़ेगा कई लोग उसमें एक अदर प्रॉब्लम है कि लोग इंक्रोचमेंट कर लेते हैं तालाब है जैसे दिल्ली में कितने सारे तालाब थे उसको इंक्रोचमेंट करके और कई सारे बिल्डर्स ने उसको इंक्रोचमेंट करके और सेल आउट कर दिया उसमें मकान खड़े हो गए तो ये सब प्रॉब्लम्स को एक साथ जुड़ा हुआ है उसको कैसे हम लोग डिफाइन करेंगे और उसको कैसे हम लोग को रोकना होगा तभी ये हीट वेव और जो ग्राउंड वाटर को रिचार्ज हम बढ़ा सकते हैं। देखिए चिल्ड्रन के संदर्भ में एक को हम बात करते हैं कि प्राइमरी स्कूल के बच्चे हैं और एक उसके बाद सेकेंडरी से ऊपर जो कॉलेज लेवल के चिल्ड्रन है तो इन द जनरल प्रिकॉशनरी जो मेजर्स उनके साथ लिया जाता है कि ड्यूरिंग द हीट वे पीरियड इन डिफरेंट स्टेट में अलग अलग स्टेट uh, गवर्नमेंट इसको गवर्न करती है ड्यूरिंग द हीट वे पीरियड उसका समर uh, वकेशन uh, हो जाता है कुछ स्टेट को अगर जैसे पता चलता है कि पंद्रह दिन पहले अगर हीट वेव आ गया तो उसको पंद्रह दिन पहले भी क्लोज कर देते हैं जैसे इस साल बंगाल ने एक महीना पहले गर्मी का छुट्टी कर दी दूसरा चीज है कि हीट वेव का जब आ, आ, बच्चे के ऊपर बहुत ज्यादा इफेक्ट पड़ता है वो बच्चे को पता नहीं चलता है कि ये आ, क्या टेम्परेचर है और कितना गर्मी फील करते हैं और बच्चे ज्यादा उसको महसूस करते हैं लेकिन आ, बड़े लोग तो समझ जाते हैं कि ये हीट वेव का प्रभाव है हमें ज्यादा पानी पीना चाहिए ऐसे और हम कैसे बच सकते हैं छतरी लगाएं टोपी लगाएं ये लेकिन बच्चे थोड़ा बाल मन होने के कारण वो इस चीज सब का प्रिकॉशन नहीं ले पाते तो एक तो इफेक्ट करता है दूसरी चीज है कि कई लोग स्कूल क्लोजर होने के बावजूद भी जो कोचिंग इंस्टीट्यूट है उनका भी एक बड़े पैमाने पे वो काम करते हैं और बोलते हैं कि हाँ स्कूल चलिए आप क्लोज हो गया तो आप दिन में ट्यूशन पढ़ने आ जाइए तो ये एक भी बड़ा चैलेंज है कि उसको भी कैसे रिस्ट्रिक्ट किया जाए कि आप बच्चे को या तो घर पे आके पढ़ाना है तो पढ़ाइए अदरवाइज बाहर हम बच्चे को ड्यूरिंग द समर सीजन हम मिड उसमें नहीं भेजेंगे क्योंकि वो कोचिंग इंस्टीट्यूट ये मानते हैं कि हाँ स्कूल का टाइमिंग खत्म हो गया आप स्कूल तो है नहीं आप ग्यारह बजे आ जाइए बारह बजे आ जाइए स्कूल तो जाना नहीं है तो बच्चे भी उसमें जाने की कोशिश करते हैं तो वो अफेक्टेड होता है जैसे एक पंद्रह का उदाहरण है कि एक केंद्रीय विद्यालय का एक बच्चा इस ड्यूरिंग द स्कूल पीरियड में वो हीट वेब से गश्त खा करके और उसमें डेथ हो गया था तो ये दो बच्चे उसमें डेथ हो गए थे काफी बच्चे हालांकि हीट से अफेक्टेड हुए थे तो उसके बाद ये रूल्स वहां पे स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ने तुरंत एक्शन ले करके और स्कूल को क्लोजर किया और क्लोजर करने के साथ साथ वो पॉलिसी बनाया कि ड्यूरिंग द हीट वेव पीरियड हम 
फ्री समर वैकेशन घोषित कर सकते हैं तो पॉलिसी लेवल पे है और इम्प्लीमेंटेशन लेवल पे है और पब्लिक को भी समझना होगा मैंने जो स्टूडेंट्स है या जो माता पिता है उनको ड्यूरिंग द हीट डे पीरियड में हम कैसे अवॉइड कर सकते थैंक यू सर धन्यवाद सर हम आपका आभार प्रकट करते हैं आपके इतने एलेबोरेट तरीके से आपने डिस्कशन ओ सॉरी हेलो डॉक्टर अर्जुन एम आई ऑडिबल ओके सर कैन यू हेयर मी यस यस सर धन्यवाद सर हम आपका आभार प्रकट करते हैं आपके इतने एलेबोरेट डिस्कशन ने हमारा प्रभावी बनाने के लिए और थैंक यू सो मच श्री श्रीवास्तव जी फॉर बीइंग विद अस थैंक यू थैंक यू जितेंद्र सर जी प्लीज रैप अप दिस सेशन जितेंद्र सर okay we can go ahead with vote of thanks for the okay. day okay okay as we come to end of day 2 of a 3 day immersive online certificate training program on understanding recurring heat waves risk impact and the way forward for resilience this training course is organized by national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs and in pre center for environment climate change and sustainable development CECCSD IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute I Saurabh Himire researcher at IMPRI would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Center for Environment Climate Change and Sustainable Development IMPRI and National Institute for Disaster Management or NIDM Ministry of Home Affairs India We are very grateful to our experts for the day 2 of this training Dr Gulrez Shah Azhar Professor Joy Shri Roy and Shri Anup Kumar Shivastava We thank the patron for the program Shri Taj Hasan Kameda and moderator Shri Tikender Singh Panwar our convenors Professor Dr Anil K Gupta Dr Simi Mehta and Dr Somedeep Chattopadhyay We thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and are actively involved in today's deliberation we thank all those who are watching us live on facebook youtube listening to our podcast or reading our publications we welcome you tomorrow again on july 28th for our day 3 session of this excellent training course by distinguished experts dr may matthew dr manu gupta and dr pooja paswan we hope you continue to join in future to our impri hashtag web policy talk talk and web policy learning have a nice day and thank you